Good evening. At this time, I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting of November 14, 2022. For viewers watching at home, some members of the public may be participating via video conference or teleconference. This time, I'd like to ask if you are able to please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Buss? Present. Commissioner Lanson? Present. Commissioner Link? Way over here. Commissioner McMahon absent. Chair Newman? Present. It's time now for written comments, announcements, supplemental packet, and continuances. Um, we have with us Deputy Community D Development Director John Dugan. Mr. Dugan, are there any such documents for us tonight? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. We have a supplemental packet that's been distributed to the Commission and posted containing written correspondence related to item 7A. Thank you. This is normally the time in our hearing where we would have public comments unrelated to any item on our agenda, but I understand there are no public comments. So we will move then to our consent calendar. And I will ask my fellow commissioners for comments and or a motion to approve the consent calendar. Commissioner I'll Buss. And, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the uh, minutes of the meeting of October 24th. Thank you. Any discussion? Yes, Chair. Commissioner Link. Uh, notice in the notes that there was discussion about having an eight foot high garden wall, and it was my understanding that the approval was to have the wall constructed or under construction uh, at the earliest possible time, but that we had nixed the height requirement due to the footing. My recollection was that the height requirement stayed in place and that what we had added was um, a condition that required that the wall construction begin as, as soon as any construction began, was my understanding, possibly mistaken. I'm not at this point remembering what the original height of the wall was. It was eight feet. Was it eight feet or yeah. was it six? It was eight. It was eight. Okay. Yeah. Then I stand corrected. Are there any other, uh, any changes, any amendments, friendly or otherwise, to Commissioner Buss's motion? Very well. I'll ask, please, that you prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4-1, Councilmember McMahon absent. Thank you. So we have uh, five, count them, five hearings this evening. And I will ask the clerk to please open our first public hearing. Hearing having been advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 7A, development permit DP 2022-70164, special use permit SUP 2022-70165, protected tree permit PTP 2022-70167, and mitigated negative declaration MND 2022-70188, SCH number 20220. 90077 to approve the redevelopment of the site with four one and two story buildings totaling 351,164 square feet for office and lab uses, restaurant and lounge with alcohol activities, 854 parking spaces and associated infrastructure improvements. The project involves preservation of 13 protected trees, transplanting 10 protected trees on site, removal of 54 protected trees, planting of 87 coast live oak trees, and the payment of in-lieu fees for the off-site replacement of protected trees. Weekly special events with 100 or fewer people are expected during the hours of 8 a.m. through 9 p.m. The 18.99 acre parcel has a general planned land use of industrial and is zoned industrial park M1. 
and also approve the mitigated negative declaration and miti mitigation monitoring and reporting program, MMRP, in accordance with California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, for the subject property. Property located at 1100 Rancho Boulevard, Rancho Canejo Boulevard. The applicant is Alexandria Real Estate Equities Incorporated. Thank you. And presenting on behalf of staff tonight is Senior Planner Scott Colwitz. And we also have available for questions uh, Deputy Community Development Director John Dugan, Planning Division Manager Steve Kearns, Senior Civil Engineer Jim Taylor. Uh, our transportation planner from Public Works, Ms. Kathy Naum, and our assistant city attorney, uh, Noel Duran. Mr. Colwitz, good evening. Good evening, Chair Newman and members of the Planning Commission. Thank you for having us tonight for this item. Uh, so as you just heard, this is a project to redevelop 1100 Rancho Canelo Boulevard. And uh, thank you for doing the introductions of other city staff for me. Um, in addition, the applicant team brought a full uh, team with them. They'll have a chance to introduce themselves during their presentation. So in summary, the request, without repeating all the words we just heard, is to essentially approve three permits tonight. A development permit uh, for uh, some a new life science campus on the project site. Um, in addition, a special use permit to allow a restaurant with alcohol use a protected tree permit uh, to allow the removal and replacement of various trees, and then ultimately uh, the mitigated negative declaration to be in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. So I'm gonna jump right into some background on the project site for everyone, um, and then we'll move through our analysis of the actual project itself. So the project site uh, from 1938 through, 1930, through 1973 was used for agricultural purposes um, as well as grazing and livestock. Um, and it remained that way until 1973 when the site was originally developed uh, for the Adventist Media Center. Uh, it was consisting of a communication center of approximately 170,000 square feet. Uh, there were various administrative office, radio and television recording studios, a printing plant, uh, mail order departments, warehouse space, and other infrastructure and landscaping on the project site. And it stayed that way from 1973 um, through 1995 when uh, Amgen bought the project and repurposed it. Between those intervening years, it was, it was annexed into the city from Ventura County into the city of Thousand Oaks in 1989. Between 1995 and 2017, there were a series of, of permits that were issued to modify the project, but all in all, it was used for life science purposes, similar to what we're anticipating the site to be used with this proposed project. Um, as we move forward, uh, the current applicant, Alexandria, Al Alexandria Real Estate Equities, or simply Alexandria, uh, purchased the property in 2019. And then in July of 20, sorry, February of 2022, so of this year, Alexandria submitted their permit entitlements that are before you today. And in July of 2022, a ministerial permit was issued to start the demolition of the buildings as well as remove non-protected trees. As far as the project setting, uh, the project site is generally, generally located east of Rancho Caneo Boulevard and north of N2 Park Road. The nearly 19-acre parcel has a general plan land use designation of industrial and is zoned M1, or industrial park. The project is within the city's urbanized area with transportation and utility infrastructure currently in place. The site topography undulates throughout the property. Generally speaking, the project rises from Rancho Caneo Boulevard and Ventu Park Road to the center of the site and then it descends the various property lines on the side as well as into the rear of the property. The rear of the property itself is undeveloped, but it's been used for Amgen's nurseries over the years to grow and maintain boxed trees to be lo to located on various parts of their campus. Surrounding development includes another Alexandria Life Science development directly to the north at 1250 to 1290 Rancho Caneo Boulevard the Rancho Caneo Village HOA to the north and east, Amgen facilities to the east and south, and existing industrial office and commercial uses generally to the south and west. 
The project site shares two common property lines with the Rancho Caneo Village HOA, which means that the project site is within 400 feet of a known sensitive use as established by the city's municipal code, primarily residential uses. Further down Rancho Caneo Boulevard at 999 Rancho Caneo Boulevard, approximately 700 feet from this property, is another sensitive use as a, a religious institution. Jumping into this actual project. So this project includes the development of the first purpose-built campus for life science tenants in Thousand Oaks. It's designed to attract innovative companies by fostering collaboration and community building. It's modeled after the idea of university campuses. The open spaces are designed to provide quiet thinking spaces, and the more active spaces are to foster interactions and exchanging innovative ideas to further, redevelop, to further research and development um, and ideas. The proposal includes one project to be, to be developed in two phases over the course of 36 months. And taking you through those phases, we have two images on the, on the screen. Phase one would consist of grading the entire property, on-site mainline utilities, access and circulation aisles would be installed during this phase, and we would reuse the existing entrances off of um, uh, Ventu Park Road um, into the project site during this phase. Three buildings would be constructed during phase one. The Alexandria Amenity Building, that's the one-story building up front with the restaurant, and buildings A and B. In addition, parking and landscaping would be uh, installed as part of this phase. During phase two, the building C, that's the building on the left side of the site plan, uh, would be constructed, and all remaining parking and landscaping would be installed at that point. As a real quick summary, the architectural design of the buildings reflect a modernist simplicity that frames and complements the Arboretum centerpiece of the landscape campus. The building material palette is a combination of concrete walls, glazed curtain walls, and natural wood accents to, re to reference the Arboretum. The single-story amenity building uh, is more closely used to the California modernist aesthetic and palette with wood cladding accentuated by stretches of natural stone uh, and glazed portal openings at the most active spaces. Uh, and this is all to connect the buildings with the landscape to blur the line between the interior and the exterior. The center of the campus is the Arboretum, and that serves as a focal point for the outdoor gatherings, uh, for casual hubs, for meetings and lunches, and for walking paths. The focus of the project's central arboretum is to connect the four buildings together to operate as a central outdoor room for the life science campus. As the site undulates, uh, a significant amount of grading is needed to achieve this design. This grading map image uh, has been provided to show areas which would be cut, represented in orange, and areas that would be filled, represented in green. A key principle behind the grading design was to set the grading zero point along the spine of the Arboretum uh, to retain four large California sycamore trees. Um, in the tree report, they were identified as number 20, 21, 22, and 23. And respectively, they're measured as num at 33 inches, 18 inches, 23 inches, and 38 inches uh, DBH. And just to point those out uh, on the screen, uh, this is the central spine that we're talking about with two of the trees located here and two of the trees located here. Uh, I'm gonna go back for a quick second. So the project retains the same access and drive aisle configuration of the prior development. Uh, the drive aisle itself circles the campus, flanking, uh, flanked by a parking lot in the upper portion of the property, and the lower parking area is proposed in phase two. Uh, and our transportation engineers uh, in City Hall uh, did evaluate the project and determined that the current access is sufficient for the current project. Continue on with the project summary. The height of the proposed development is similar to the height of the buildings that had been there. As illustrated with the graphics on this screen, the profile of the prior buildings and grade are outlined in the red dash. 
in, uh, and then the current proposed buildings are identified with the blue uh, boxes, and we could also see uh, some of the screening elements that are proposed on the building uh, above the roof. In comparison to some other industrial buildings in the immediate area, uh, the height is re relatively consistent, um, and the heights that are proposed are s less than what's allowed in the Amgen specific plan, where buildings as high as 55 feet and 75 feet can be proposed. So how this project fits in with the neighborhood. The development team has worked with both the city as well as the neighbors to address the edge conditions of this project site relative to the neighbors. The property owner has intentionally placed landscaping along the perim perimeter of the site, and they've added rows of landscaping uh, in the parking lot to buffer the residential properties from the proposed development. The, park, the project has also been conditioned for perimeter walls and fencing to mitigate parked vehicle headlights from glaring into adjacent residential pro properties. Additional landscaping is proposed along both Rancho Caneo Boulevard as well as Ventu Park Road. And as we think about how does this project fit in with the, the larger city vision, the proposed project is consistent with the city's general plan, as the project consists of an industrial use within an industrial area. It's located within a district that has other industrial uses, and it's on a site that has easy access to uh, the Ventura Freeway Corridor. The proposed development consists of light industries that are highly specialized, scientific, and or research oriented. In addition, this employment center provides industrial and commercial employment opportunities, and it provides both community needs and high paying employment opportunities, as well as a restaurant to serve both the employees and the general public. The City Council's 2022-23 fiscal year economic development priorities identified the facilitation of continued investment in Thousand Oaks with projects like the Alexandria campus development at 1100 Rancho Caneo. And in addition to that, the proposed project is complementary to the Thousand Oaks uh, Economic Development Strategic Plan as the project implements goals to create a diverse employment base and expands existing businesses, which create new jobs that contribute to the fiscal health of Thousand Oaks. The development of a state-of-the-art life science campus is anticipated to result in a short-term economic growth during the actual construction of the facility but maybe more importantly, long-term growth is anticipated through the employment of approximately 2,250 people in the biotechnology industry and the distribution and sales of their products. And in terms of zoning consistency, the project is consistent with all development standards of the M1 with the exception of the building's maximum height. The applicant has developed plans which are compliant with the maximum retaining wall heights, but they've identified two locations which could decrease the amount of grading that's needed on the property if that retaining wall height was allowed to be increased to 12 feet in two specific locations. We'll go through those uh, 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 thought processes and with some graphics here in just a quick second, but the, uh, what's important is to highlight that the Planning Commission has the authority to grant a waiver to increase the maximum building height and retaining wall height. So with that, I'm gonna jump into the building waiver, uh, or the building height waiver. So staff supports granting the maximum building height waiver to allow the height increases of buildings A, B, and C above a maximum of 35 feet as measured from the adjacent grade. Okay. The industrial buildings are designed as 35 foot tall buildings. However, due to the size of the buildings and the undulating grade on the project site, Portions of the building as measured from the bottom of grade to the top of the building uh, exceed the 35 foot height limit. Um, and an example of this is in building C, which is here highlighted on your screen. This red triangle shows the area where the bottom of the building would be at 35 feet measuring up to the top of the parapet. But as the grade drops, there's a, a difference and the height waiver essentially is to uh, accommodate that height difference. In addition to the grade compared to the building height, uh, the buildings also have a mechanical equipment screen on the top of the building. And those screens exceed the maximum height by an additional 13 feet above the parapet. 
uh, to minimize the perceived height of the structures, um, the buildings are set back further into the property than required by the front, side, and rear setbacks. As shown in the top right image in this slide, the screens are set further back into the building itself. From the narrowest side of the buildings to the screen, they're set back approximately 40 feet from the edge of the building. From the uh, side that has the, the bigger indentation, that's about 100 feet that they're set back from the edge of the building. As shown in the bottom graphic, the screen design is in the shape of a butterfly and the, along the building's longest access. The tallest part of the screen is 13 feet tall in this general location and this general location, but as it dips down into the center, it's only eight feet tall above the parapet at the shortest point. Additionally, the materials of these screens are perforated metal, which will help uh, provide a visual softening to the screens. And there are rows of trees to be planted between both the public right-of-way as well as the property lines to further uh, screen uh, the buildings and their collective height. So collectively, these design measures uh, reduce the perceived height of the buildings uh, and the screens. In terms of the retaining walls, so staff supports granting the maximum retaining wall height waiver to allow retaining walls to exceed a maximum of six feet up to a maximum of 12 feet in two locations for the purpose of reducing the amount of grading without negatively impacting public views. Additionally, there's addition, uh, there could be uh, opportunities for additional landscaping if that waiver is supported. So in the first location, as shown on the left side of the screen, um, this is along the western side of the property of the drive aisle connecting the project to Rancho Caneo Road in this uh, area. Um, the retaining wall, as outlined in red here, which would be located generally in this area back here, um, it would be primarily visible to the industrial properties uh, to the north of the project, to 1250 through 1290 Rancho Bo Caneo Boulevard and partially visible from Rancho Caneo Boulevard itself. The second location is in the rear of the property, as shown on the images in the right. Uh, these, uh, the retaining wall itself would be uh, along the grade down into the property, into the rear parking lot in this general location outlined in red. All retaining walls, are, if they're allowed to be uh, well, just all retaining walls, period, need to fold in design elements from the buildings themselves, and they're required to be landscaped to soften the view of the retaining walls. Um, this retaining wall uh, on the right side of the screen, though, um, it's not going to be something that's seen from the public right-of-way. It would be seen, again, primarily from uh, the Alexandria project to the north, um, as well as uh, perhaps from some of the residential properties to the north and the east. In terms of the special use permit that's being proposed for this project, um, it's required to allow the campus to have a restaurant uh, and lounge with on-site sale and consumption of beer, wine, and spirits. The restaurant and lounge would be open to both employees and the public, um, and it would be open from 7 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Monday through Sunday as far as maximum hours in the permit. Operational hours could be less than that, but uh, in terms of the permit, those are the maximum parameters. The project site shares two common property lines with the Rancho Caneo Village HOA, which means that the project site is within 400 feet of a known sensitive use. However, the restaurant and lounge is located more than 450 feet away from the nearest property line, and there would be the building, uh, building A in particular, um, intervening between the, the restaurant and the closest residence. So noise from the restaurant and lounge is not anticipated to cause any disturbance to any of the surrounding uses. The restaurant and lounge would be open to the public and it's anticipate, anticipated to be an amenity to those living in the area, as well as those working on the project site. And the restaurant use at the project site would be compatible with land uses in the vicinity, vicinity that are predominantly industrial, including the existing restaurant located at one Amgen Center Drive. 
So the proposed restaurant and lounge with alcohol service um, is something that only is not su is supported by staff, but it's also been conditioned by the police department and community development department to make sure that it maintains compatibility with the surrounding uses. The third permit that you have before you tonight is a protected tree permit. Uh, on site, uh, the property had 249 non-protected trees. In addition to that, there were 77 protected trees consisting of California sycamore trees, coast live oak trees, holly oaks, and valley oaks. The Oak Tree Preservation and Protection Ordinance allows for protected tree encroachments, prunings, and removals if the request is not contrary to the purpose and intent of the ordinance. And in this case, encroaching, pruning, and removing uh, uh, was found to be necessary for reasonable use and is, uh, of the property and is consistent with the intent of the protected tree regulations. Removing trees, though, does mean that we're replacing trees. So the project as designed requires removal of 64 protected trees. 10 of those would be transplanted on the site and then an additional uh, 13 would have levels of encroachment. The, trees, uh, impact, the tree impacts are necessary to allow site preparation and grading activities for the proposed life science campus and associated site improvements. The figure on the left demonstrates the development areas and the tree locations affected by the proposed construction activities. Uh, the, the image on the right shows the planting plan, which includes 87 coast live oak trees. The city's current uh, tree protection regulations uh, give direction that when we're replacing existing trees, we replace them at a three to one ratio with two trees being 24 inch box and one being 36 inch box. The applicant team has gone well above and beyond that though. They're proposing 12 36 inch box trees. They're proposing 72 48 inch box trees and they're proposing three 72 inch box trees, uh, which vastly exceeds the requirements that they're otherwise to follow. But even with putting that many trees on this project site, the site cannot accommodate all of the trees required per mitigation. So the project has been conditioned for the community development director to approve planting tr of trees at an offsite location for public benefit and or requiring an in lieu cash payment to the city's open space endowment fund. Uh, one other thing that we wanted to point out is uh, given the history of this project site, there were two uh, prior oak tree permits that had been approved in prior years. And through those oak tree permits, there were some mitigation, mitigated trees that were supposed to be planted on the site that were planted. And all of the trees that were previously identified to be planted as part of mitigation are either being retained as part of the, this project or they're part of the transplanted trees. So all the trees that were previously planted on the site for mitigation will remain on the project site at the end of the day. Jumping forward to your last action is CEQA. So in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, a comprehensive evaluation of the potential environmental impacts for the project was performed. The mitigated negative declaration evaluated the project's physical development and uses, uh, which were reasonable and foreseeable. This evaluation determined that the project would not have a significant impact on the environment with uh, implementation of mitigation measures which were included in the MND. The 30-day public review period for the mitigated negative declaration ran between September 6th and October 6th of this year. Um, it was uh, distributed both locally as well as through the state's clearinghouse. And through that, staff received a total of six agency letters, uh, one from Caltrans, one from the Fish and Department of Fish and Wildlife, one from uh, Ventura County Air Pollution Control District, uh, one from Ventura County Resource Management Ag Agency, one from the Environmental Health Division of the county, and one from Ventura County Public Works Agency, uh, their Water Resource Division. Um, and we also received one public uh, comment uh, from the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. 
The city prepared response to comments uh, for all of those letters that we received, um, and we've incorporated those into the final mitigated negative declaration that was included in the Planning Commission's packet. None of the comments that we received on the draft mitigated negative declaration uh, for this project mer merited any substantial change to the environmental analysis or conclusions contained in the draft mitigated negative declaration. Appropriate measures uh, are in place to ensure no significant adverse environmental impacts are going to result from the project. Mitigation measures um, have been written to cover uh, things such as light glare, construction air quality, a workers' environmental awareness program, um, and monitoring for both biological and cultural resource protection, um, restoration of vegetation, uh, vapor barriers for the building, solid waste management plans, and uh, landscape plans to be consistent with the Ventura County Fire Department's uh, prohibited plant list. These mitigation measures are all incorporated into the project resolution that's placed before you to ensure that the project will have no significant adverse effects on the environment. Staff is therefore recommending that the Planning Commission approve the final MND uh, prepared for the project, again, in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. In, public, in terms of public correspondence, we've reached out to the community. Uh, notice of application was first posted on the project site on April 1st of this year, and a revised notice of application was posted on September 16th of this year. In addition, public notification was sent out as part of the uh, mitigated negative declaration public review period and for your hearing tonight. Uh, through all of that conversations, uh, staff has received some calls from members of the public, but we've only received two comment letters on the entirety of the project. One was included in your packet, and it asked about construction-related impacts as essentially associated with, um, with stockpiles, if you will. The second one came today and was included in your supplemental packet. It came from the Chamber of Commerce, and they were supportive of the project. In addition to the city's uh, outreach, the applicant team has been actively engaged with the community, and they submitted a very thorough outreach report identifying all of their activities, and they'll talk about that in their presentation. So, in conclusion, the proposed project has been designed to meet the intent of the city's standards, codes, and policies. The proposed building design and site layout integrates well with the surrounding development and has a cohesive architectural and landscape design to create a purpose-built campus for life science tenants in Thousand Oaks. Again, it's designed to attract innovative companies by fostering collaboration and community building. Based on the analysis and findings contained in this report uh, and your resolutions, staff recommends approval of the mitigated negative declaration written for this project and approval of the project subject to the conditions of approval in the attached resolution. And staff would encourage the Planning Commission to support our recommendation to you, as on the screen here, to approve both the MND first followed by the resolution. And with that, we're available for any questions you may have tonight. Thank you, Mr. Kollwitz, very much for your presentation. Before we go to Commissioner questions, I believe Commissioner Link has an ex parte communication to disclose. Commissioner? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an ex parte communication to disclose with the, uh, a consultant for the applicant. Uh, we had a brief conversation that was more or less inconsequential, just a check-in. Thank you for disclosing that. And I'll open it up now for Commissioner questions. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Colwitz. Detailed report, thank you. And you're, you're, I can tell you're learning about us because you actually tried to be clairvoyant and answer our questions before we asked them, but you didn't get all of them. So I'm going to have a few. Um, initially, you actually commented about the, uh, the letter we got from the public, uh, and she was concerned about some of the construction issues. Did we get back to her? Uh, commissioners, yes, is the short answer. Not only did staff get back in touch with her, but we also connected the applicant team with her, and they had a chance to talk about uh, construction-related concerns. Okay, then I'll, I'll ask the applicant that, that part of it. Um, I kind of want to understand the tree issue. Um, you indicated before that they had gotten a, uh, I think an administrative, um, I guess, approval uh, to remove some trees before this process, correct? Years ago, uh, as part of the approvals in 95, 96, when Amgen first bought the campus, they expanded their parking lot. There were some oak tree impacts at that point in time, and they had to replace some trees on site. Um, through that, there were a total of six oak trees that need to be replaced on site. 
of those six, three of them are staying exactly in the same place, and three of them are being proposed to be transplanted elsewhere on the project site. But the applicant themselves has not removed any trees yet? None of the protected trees. Okay, oh, prote okay. that was the distinction. All right. And again, the, you, you cited the, uh, the uh, trees and in terms of what the replacements can be. That was actually pretty substantial. Uh, are, are those types of, uh, I guess, 36 and 72, are those even available? Generally speaking, yes. Um, that's a large quantity, so the applicant team will have to source them to bring them uh, here, but yes, they should be available as we're moving forward. That did seem like a rather substantial uh, replacement, so I just want to make sure we actually have the availability of finding those. Um, you indicated on the retaining wall issue, um, the two areas that they'd have to comply with our rules. Exactly what would be put in front of them? What design would it have, if you know? So the actual uh, retaining wall design would, and the landscaping associated with that would come to us as part of plan check. Um, currently, uh, what's being proposed essentially would be staggered retaining walls. Uh, the thought, uh, so if they move forward without that waiver, it would be staggered retaining walls, um, but more grading potentially required on site. Uh, if the Planning Commission would allow them to have up to 12 foot tall retaining walls in those two locations, uh, the retaining wall would have to have the same look, if you will, in terms of materials and design as other retaining walls on the project site, which are supposed to mimic the design of the buildings, if you will, and incorporate those type of elements. Um, and then they're supposed to be softened by landscaping consistent with the rest of the landscaping plan. So the neighbors on that second one wouldn't be staring at a 12-foot wall concrete structure, right? They would actually be staring at landscaping and something that would fit in with the rest of the construction. Um, Possibly not, and I would say prob uh, because of the amount of landscaping between the rear property line that borders uh, the project site and where the walls would be going, the landscape canopies out there and the other retaining walls and, and perimeter walls uh, would likely screen most of that wall from being seen from the residential properties. Okay. I don't, don't want to affect the property values of looking at a concrete wall if we can. Um, but you said there's two stages that are going to be done. Um, is if stage one is complete, are those buildings then open for occupancy uh, while stage two is going on, or is it nothing opens until the entire stages are done? From the city's perspective, we would be able to issue a certificate of occupancy to allow for the uh, phase one buildings to be activated, if you will. Uh, but ultimately, when they become active is a decision up to the, uh, the applicant. Would there be sufficient parking with regard to phase one if you actually allowed it to be occupied on an incremental basis? Uh, yes. Okay. And then you talked about the height of the, the, uh, the buildings. Uh, and again, something I just want to make a clarification. Um, you indicated that actually it seemed like you said that it complied with the Amgen specific plan in terms of the height. Uh, this is not in the Amgen specific plan. Um, we were giving a comparison for other development that might be in the area. So it, this project, um, it's not even in the Rancho Caneo specific plan. It's the M1 property itself. It's almost a little island un, unto itself out here. Um, so it has to comply with the M1 regulations, which would allow up to 35 feet. Other existing industrial buildings are consistent with that height with some parapets that uh, do come above some of those buildings. Uh, but the most immediate neighbor it has uh, to the south is the Amgen project uh, property. And some of those buildings are uh, either today between 55 and 75 feet, and the plan would also allow future buildings to be that tall. And from your diagram, it looked like, I mean, if they wanted to take away tons more of dirt to actually make it lower, they could actually get under the height, but it's really just because of the grade issue that it goes over in height. <laughs> yes, is, is the short answer. The, the buildings are so long that at what point in time do you keep importing dirt versus allowing the architecture of the building itself to just state itself and seek the waiver? Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Buss? Thank you, Chair. A um, couple quick questions. I don't have anything too complicated. I think you got most of what I was curious about. Um, the hours of operation for the restaurant, 7 to 1130, is that standard for every restaurant in TO or is that unique to this spot? I know we've had this discussion before about uh, drive through so I just want to make sure I'm not approving something that's out of the uh, norm. Yeah, that, uh, thank you, Commissioner Buss. There's no standard operation hours in the city for restaurant uses. So it's based on case-by-case -case use. Um, 
I think you're referring to the Starbucks location that we talked about uh, in the recent past. Um, they have specific hours of operation restrictions because of their proximity to the residential, and its location is about 100 feet. Yeah, this yeah, is about 400 feet away, so it's not as sensitive as the other use. But when, we, but when you issue, uh, not, say, along Thousand Oaks Boulevard, are they over, are allowed to be open until 1130? Yes, they are. Okay, that's all I was curious about. All right, and then uh, just, well, just to go back into trees again, because, you know, we mm -hmm. all love trees here. So we're starting with 77 protected trees. We're taking out 64. We're giving back 10. And then we're adding in another 87 for a total of 110 protected trees on the site. Yes. Is that my ma is, I'm just I'm just making sure my math's correct here. Uh, yes, is, is, is the right? short answer. And then how many trees are they short officially of the, uh, the total they'd need to replace? Yeah, 54 times uh, 3 is 162. Because uh, that was going to be my question to you. Is it 52 or the 10 they, tr they, they transplant, do they have to add yeah, they, on to that? Would there be like an additional 20 trees or no? No, the ones that are transplanted on site they don't are, count against. Are, are still staying on the project. So site. those don't count against their total. So it'd be 152 total. They're putting in 87. So then it would be like what, 65 ish? Uh, roughly. Um, I, I should have had that number on the fly, but I don't have okay. that one. I, I, okay, so then 65 trees would be their obligation. And uh, we're saying that we'll either do that or cash in lieu. Correct. Okay. That's, that's become a thing with us, and that's why I'm just curious about that. Uh, the, other, the other thing I want to confirm that I heard correctly from you is you stated that this sp specific uh, um, plot of land is not in the Amgen specific plan and not in the Rancho specific plan. Either that is one. correct. How much, and this is just for my own uh, morbid curiosity, um, how, much, how many properties don't fall under those two that are over there? Not many. Uh, it's really this one, I think, is the This is the only one? I, I, I feel like this is probably our unique case in that situation. I just yeah. want to make sure. Because it was annexed in 1989, is that why? Because I thought everything was annexed in 1989. Yeah, the, the vast swaths of that land were, were annexed in 1989. The development of the Rancho Caneo specific plan and, and Amgen, I don't know the years of those two. Do you know those? So this one just kind of fell through the cracks randomly? Well, Amgen came online in the 90s. Um, the SP-15 was in the 80s. It got annexed from the county to the city. And uh, we also have the um, SP-7 and 8 to the northern part of the, that area. Yeah. Um, next to the uh, Municipal Service Center. Yeah. So there, there are multiple specific plans out in the area. But this parcel of land, these, um, it's sort of an island between them. Okay. There's no need for us to put it into one of those categories at this point, I guess, if we approve this. Eh? No, if it uh, falls under the development standards for the M1 zone, so it, it really doesn't need its own specific plan. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, those, those are all my questions for now. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Link. Hey, Chair. Just wanted to verify something that I thought I heard you say during your presentation and that the restaurant was mandated as part of the development. No, not mandated. It's something that's uh, proposed by the applicant team. Proposed by the applicant team, and okay. And it's, it's for benefits of both their own employees as well as members of the public. Uh, they can visit it as well. Okay. Did the previous development have a restaurant associated with it? No, it didn't. Uh, it was uh, uh, print shop and production studios for television and radio, those type of things, but no restaurant on site. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this. So the size of the restaurant based on the staff report looked to be about 7,500 square feet gross. Is that about correct? Uh, no, it's slightly smaller than that. It's in the 5,000s. Um, for in including all ancillary facilities, so bathrooms, so bathrooms, kitchen, storage, et cetera. If you start stretching it that way, then yes. 7,500, okay. Uh, I was curious because the in the MND, the um, traffic assessment was based on PM peak hour trips and it was based on the industrial park use inclusively. So there are ancillary uses that we would necessarily consider as part of that trip generation unless they were open to the public. Because this facility would be and because the previous use didn't, I'm sort of looking at that as being maybe additional trips on top of what I would consider as part of the industrial park use. 
And for a restaurant, 7,500 gross square feet, you're looking at 123 p.m. peak hour trips in addition to the industrial park. So I was curious why it wasn't considered a separate use if it's open to the public in addition to the users of the site. Um, good evening, Kathy Naum, um, transportation planner. We gave this a lot of thought when we were trying to figure, determine land on their trip generation. And part of what we rationalize is that the restaurant use, since it's open to the public, it's, we look at it, it's, it's really a neighborhood restaurant use. It's not a regional city-wide restaurant use. A lot of those trips would already be passerby trips. Somebody would be going home. They would stop and go, meet people there that are more in their neighborhood. And at the same time, people who would generally be leaving work based on typical trip generation would be staying to have dinner. So that also cancels out a lot of the PM peak hour trips that are not leaving. Then you have these passerby trips. There's really no... Like the example you use is, is, is an anomaly. To, it doesn't really fit this type of use. So we, based on the decrease in number of existing trips that wouldn't be leaving and then the passerby trips of people coming to the, they would, or they, I shouldn't just say they live in the neighborhood. They might work in the Amgen area. So they're already over there. So then they would go over to this building. They might walk, they may not, you know. So that's how we ended up not adding those as additional trips. Okay, we so there really wasn't, considered it a wash. There wouldn't necessarily be any primary trips that would be passed by internal capture, et cetera. That's how we justify okay, it, yes, understand. exactly. Uh, I think the only other, well, before I switch gears, um, so uh, I, I guess I didn't read the part of the uh, staff report that said that uh, a, um, a demolition permit had been issued at, at, uh, at risk uh, based on this permit, so I drove out to the site just for yucks, I guess. Uh, and uh, noticed that the uh, existing driveway on Ventu is fairly close to the intersection and potentially, uh, and then just the traffic engineering brain, uh, any left turns that would be coming from Rancho Conejo Boulevard making a left turn to that site would technically be an illegal maneuver. Is there, was there any thought given to potentially restricting that turning movement into the site? Well, yes, we, we've looked at it, and um, both driveways in Ventu Park are existing, and they're both full access. The driveway, the westerly most one, um, is more easter than the left turn pocket. It's just the double yellow, not a double double, so left turns are permitted into the site. And then we also um, looked at most of the inbound trips in the morning as they come off Rancho Conejo will probably won't be in conflict with the stacked left turn pocket, which, because that's really in the PM peak mm -hmm. as people are exiting and going down there. So if there's any conflicts in the future, we'll, we'll continue to look at it, but we don't see it as a problem. And it, right now it is legal. Sounds good. Uh, and then lastly, switching gears, uh, the based on the drainage plans, it looks like a significant amount of the new impervious area that's on the side, parking lots, et cetera, are going to be pushing quite a bit of the drainage to that northeast corner. Uh, was the intent, uh, there is retention required uh, as for this site based on the increase in impervious area and development, I assume. So is there the idea to retain in that northeast corner or discharge somewhere from that northeast corner? I, I, th I think I saw there was a catch basin. Yeah, we're gonna, uh, Mr. Yes, Taylor. yes, we were calling uh, Mr. Taylor down to go ahead and give the response to that question. Mr. Taylor, come on down. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioner and Commission. Uh, yes, uh, the entire project has to mitigate uh, with full retention under the current MS4 permit. Uh, it was adopted in 2010. Uh, there were some preliminary soils analyses done on the site, and some of the absorption rates are astounding. Um, I think I recall 200 inches per hour was in one of the reports. Wow. Uh, of course, the requirement is about a half an inch per hour. So. Uh, there should be ample storage capacity within the local soils to be able to do whatever is necessary for the mitigation. In addition to the absorption, there's also going to be a uh, vegetative contact approach using a biological uh, best management practice, as we call it, that will actually uh, contact the polluted stormwater and screen out the sediments and the uh, oils and that sort of nasty stuff before it goes into the groundwater. Sounds good. I've got nothing. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Taylor, before you go, I just want to follow up on, on the question of 
stormwater and filtration. Um, as Commissioner Link noted, there's, there is the addition of a, a lot of impervious uh, surface. Was there any discussion around um, the use of permeable substances? And I know we've had that with another project recently. There were, in fact, uh, we're still entertaining that notion. In fact, uh, I think we'll probably catch it in plan check. But uh, my suggestion was around all of the perimeter where there's probably going to be less frequent filling of those parking spaces to go ahead and use that type of pervious pavement. We have been requiring or actually recommending pervious paving materials uh, since 1995 under the 9520 um, resolution. So uh, yeah, we will definitely be looking at that. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. And then following up on a question Commissioner Lanson asked, um, you, you'd indicated uh, in your staff report that no protected trees had been had yet been removed. Um, but it is the case, isn't it, that that the um, unprotected trees already have been taken taken out? Chair Newman, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, while we're talking about trees, the requirements for larger box trees are, are commendable. Um, it's great to see that we're it won't take quite as many decades to get to replacement size because we're starting from a larger point. However, um, I visited a couple of the nurseries that, that are suppliers for the city in the past few months, and they've indicated that they're having difficulty getting 48-inch, um, let alone 72-inch box trees. So my question is, are these sizes a hard and fast requirement, or is it the case as the nursery owners indicated to me, that they would be supplying smaller replacements in their in, instead. It's certainly the applicant's intent for the larger trees to come through, and that's what we're going to be looking for both during plan check as well as during the actual installation. Um, but the code requirement is the 24-inch and 36-inch box. The off-site calculation in terms of fees is is relative to. Um, the valuation of the trees that they're also bringing forth. So there's there's a balancing act with all of that, but ultimately the intent is to put in the larger trees. In terms of the availability and the conversations between this applicant team and uh, suppliers, uh, that would be an appropriate question to continue uh, forward with the applicant team when they come up and have their presentation. Right, and I will follow up with the applicant, but if I understand correctly from the city standpoint, the larger tree sizes are a should, not a must. Is that an accurate summary yes uh, and maybe an underline should given the intent of the applicant i like that underline should is distinct from should it's a stronger should yes all right thank you thanks for that um one more question on the trees um you'd mentioned that there will be some trees planted um along public rights of way to, to screen from view um do we know yet what kinds of trees those would be Yes, there's a, a full landscape plan that's included in the packet. Uh, a lot of the coast live oaks that are being proposed are along the public right of way. Okay, great. Um, regarding all the cut and fill that's happening, um, if I th if my math is right, I think we're talking about something like 2,800 truck trips um, net. Do we know? Do we know approximately? how many truck trips per day that, that works out to? Well, depending on the window they choose. Uh, but typically, uh, a, a project of this size, we can have as many as uh, 50 to 60 trucks roaring by with 10 yards apiece. Um, you caught me without my notes. I left them up in the, <laughs> up in the folding chair up there. But um, there is a suitability question also about those numbers because sometimes when you are cutting existing uh, soil, it may not be suitable for reuse on the site. And uh, of course, the import will be suitably categorized. So there's a possibility there may be a fluctuation in that number, plus or minus some percentage. I know in past cases, we've had variants of up to something like 20%. So I'm not, I'm not looking for a hard and fast number. I'm just wondering approximately how many truck trips per day might be achieved. And I think, I think you're saying something like 50 or 60 would be a reasonable number. That's correct. When we right. had some massive grading going on out at the Oaks Mall, I was astounded at how many trucks were able to roar in and out of there. Right. That's correct. Right, right. 
Okay. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, I do have one more tree question um, regarding the off-site trees. There's a condition for five years of monitoring for replacement trees. Does, and my question is, does that apply to off-site replacements as well? Yes. Very good. Okay, that's, that's all I have. Commissioners, are there any other questions of staff? Okay, very good. Then we will go to our applicant. And we've got a sizable applicant team presenting tonight. Um, I will read, uh, let's see, the main speakers are, and I apologize in advance if I'm butchering anyone's name, Peter Moglia, Stephen Pomerenke, uh, Serena Winner, and there are many others who are available for questions. Um, I'd invite the applicant team to come up to the uh, lectern and between you, um, you can divide this any which way you like. Um, you have up to 15 minutes to give a presentation and for each speaker we ask that you, you state your name and city of residence. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you guys for having us, uh, commissioners. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, listening to our presentation for our great project today. My name is Peter Moglia. I am uh, the chief, invest chief executive officer and co-chief investment officer of Alexandria Real Estate Equities. I live in Hermosa Beach, California. Um, I'm going to let the other folks introduce themselves as they come up to speak. I'm going to try to run through a very brief introduction of our company so you get a bit of a background of who we are before they started getting into the details of the project. So with that, I don't, I'm not sure who's advancing. Thanks, Scott. Um, so Alexander is really, our mission is really to enable the world's leading innovators in their um, plight to improve human health. That's the way to just really break it down. The bottom line is that the people that are working in our buildings are hoping to cure disease and improve the lives of millions of people, not only in California, but around the world. Next. So we are a real estate company. Um, Alexandria is uh, a very large company. We're actually in the S&P 500 uh, with about a $25 billion market cap. Um, so quite large, you'll see uh, an example of that on a map. But um, we are not just real estate developers because of the industry we're in. It is a very collaborative industry. In order for it to be successful, many companies have to come together oftentimes partner to get products to market. So we have to encourage that collaboration. One of the reasons we have a restaurant in our campus is to foster that collaboration. But we consider ourselves not only real estate developers, but ecosystem builders. And so these four verticals go into that. Real estate is obviously the infrastructure, but we're also, <clears throat> we also invest venture capital into the creation of companies. So we're not only building the infrastructure, but we're actually investing in the companies that will populate that ecosystem. Corporate responsibility as a public company, have absolutely job one. You have to be a great neighbor. You have to be uh, completely uh, on, um, on target with environmental goals and ensuring that you're making a place better than you left it when you came. And then thought leadership is the convening of that ecosystem. Everybody, um, so in addition to the restaurant, we actually will have conference facilities surrounding it. So we're hopeful that we'll have thought leadership events that will bring the community of life science researchers together as part of that ecosystem building. Next slide. So this is our scale. Um, we have 74 and a half million square feet in the United States. About 47 million of that uh, is either in operation or under construction or will soon be under construction. You can see that the largest um, life science clusters that we are in are San Francisco, Boston, and San Diego. Research Triangle, Suburban DC, Seattle, um, and now Texas. Uh, are smaller but growing. Los Angeles is where we're headquartered. We've always wanted to do something here. We don't have time to go into all the reasons it hasn't really populated, 
but there are things that have been happening locally, mostly with venture capital creation and companies wanting to tap into Amgen. So that presented the need for this and some other facilities we'll briefly show you next. <clears throat> As you can tell, we serve high quality companies here. 18 of the top 20 life science and uh, research and development investors in the world are our clients. So you know, I'm not saying that we're gonna bring Eli Lilly here, but Eli Lilly and Novartis and Merck all trust us to produce high quality campuses for them. And they're very big tenants. Next one. So this just gets into the, the venture creation part. We're actually the largest corporate uh, life science venture investor in North America. So we're not, it's not just like a little side hobby. We're putting a lot of over a billion dollars invested over the last decade and on our books right now. Next one. So this is just <clears throat> making sure everyone realizes that we take sustainability seriously. 43% of our revenue is coming from LEED certified buildings. We do target LEED platinum or gold. This campus will be targeted for LEED gold. Um, in addition to having LEED buildings, we also uh, set goals every 10 years um, for things like reducing carbon emissions, reducing potable water usage. We report on, the, uh, uh, on our progress of those goals every quarter and every supplemental. So we have to be accountable for that if we're not reaching them. In addition to that accountability, we report to Gresby, which gathers all of our data and then ranks us among our peers. And as you can see on the slide, we're very highly ranked. So <clears throat> just wanted to make sure everyone knows that we take that very seriously and we're gonna to continue to do that in this project. Next. In addition to being um, sustainable developers, we feel part of corporate responsibility is giving back to our, uh, the neighborhoods that we live in, but um, to society in general. So these are our eight uh, core values right now in our philanthropy program. Um, we donate a lot of money to life science research which makes a lot of sense given our business. But we also support the military, K through 12 education, um, homelessness causes, and uh, opioid addiction, things like that. Things that not only relate to our business, but things that just relate to society's issues. Next. Just an example of our thought leadership we've put on all of those conferences over the last 10 years, we have People like Anthony Fauci and Scott Gottlieb attend. I just mentioned those names because a lot of you have heard of them. But they're, you know, we get the CEO of Roche and Eli Lilly. We get these people all in a room to discuss, you know, healthcare's, you know, greatest issues. Just a couple years ago, we did a great forum on healthcare economics to talk about how does the industry address drug pricing, and the goal is to have actionable items come out of that where we can work with government to help improve things like drug pricing issues. Next. So just real quick, I wanted to give you an example of what we've already done in the city. So go ahead and advance. This is overall, um, you can see the purple, that's the campus we're talking about today. And the blue are existing properties we have either redeveloped or in the process of redeveloping. Next. <clears throat> this is um, 1280 Rancho Conejo. We, uh, you can see the upper part is what it looked like before. On the left is what it looks like today. It's been leased to Amgen spinoff Atara for over 10 years. Next. This is an incubator building. Incubator meaning we take really early stage companies, like anywhere from two people to 12 people, and put them in here for one to two years because that's all the time they should be spending in a small space and hopefully we'll push them into the new campus, into bigger space, and they'll hire a lot of people. Next. This is 1300 Rancho Conejo. Really proud of this one. You can see again the before and the upper level and what it looks like today. We get you know, incredible compliments as people drive by that, what it looked like before and what, what it looks like now. And those that work in the building absolutely love it. It's one of the you know, buildings I'm most proud of in all of our portfolio. Next. This is our current project. <clears throat> Just to the uh, west of 
1300 Rancho Conejo on a corporate center drive and we're uh, converting an old office building where the tenants moved out mostly probably due to the fact that most of their employees are now working from home and we're going to convert it to a laboratory building where you can't do that from home. And I think that's the last slide. Well, just, um, yeah, just wrapping it up with a transition to the campus. So we'll pass it over to you, Mr. Palmer. Hi, everybody. My name is Steve Pomeranke. I'm a Vice President of Real Estate and Development. Uh, I'm with Alexandria for about nine years. Uh, I'm a licensed architect and landscape architect. Um, what we wanted to do is, is really show you the project and the, the magic that we've tried to in, in, imbue into this space. Rather than just a series of buildings for life science, it's really a place-making exercise. Um, excuse me. Um, and the other thing, real quickly before we get into the space plan is, there's a number of people from the community that we've worked uh, interactively uh, quite a bit with to make sure that the project is both um, a beautiful place, but also a beautiful place for the neighbors. And I, um, hopefully that will come out uh, in conversation. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> there you go. We, we've talked about this idea of the Arboretum. What we've done is created a, a really a garden setting that um, is very campus-like, um, uh, surrounded by buildings that all feed into that open space. So with COVID, we all know that out, the outdoor space is important how people interact, the alternate workspace. But then we've uh, crystallized that with this community center we call the Alexandria. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I ask you if you bring the microphone a little, a little closer? It's a gooseneck. Yeah, if you yeah just, a little lower? Yeah. Peter's taller than that. Just so you speak sorry. into it. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? That's so, our next case. A little closer, how's that? Okay, okay. that's better, thank you. Um, uh, again, we've created this garden setting we're calling the Arboretum, uh, and it's, it's surrounded by three buildings that feed the life science, but at the heart of it is this um, community space we're calling the Alexandria. It's where the restaurant is, but it has more than just a restaurant. It's a, a fitness center with a basketball gym that could be an, out, uh, an indoor or outdoor space. Um, and then the landscape that you're seeing it, uh, colored in the center there is a series of alternate workplaces. So there's larger gathering spaces, smaller intimate spaces, because we know that the, the scientific breakthrough occurs on a walk uh, rather than at the lab bench or at their desk. So we're providing that third place. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the phasing I think is important. We are committing to building the Alexandria as part of that first phase and the garden because that's critical to the success of the project. Um, and so the building uh, A and B will then sort of create a, really that sense of place in that courtyard. The third building then become, comes online to the north and completes that, that quad. Next. Uh, we won't get into this too much, but that's some of the breakdown of the, the restaurants in the lower right, it's the purple. Uh, the yellow areas are meeting spaces. The, the big box in the center that's pink is a basketball court. Um, with a fitness center to the left, and, and uh, the, the, the whole point of this building is to build community. Community within our tenant base, but also, as Peter said, the thought leadership, we bring, want to bring people, brilliant minds to this campus to help innovate. Um, this becomes a catalyst for that. It, it just, uh, I'll mention just to the top side, plan top side of that, uh, it opens all out to the garden, the big arboretum. Next. Some really hard to read elevations of it, but it really embraces that notion of, you know, you know, threading the indoor and the outdoor uh, openness and with some, uh, some character through architectural uh, materials and massing. Next. Uh, very, very important, the plans that uh, are highly functional. One thing I think important to mention is we're carrying that design of the landscape through th uh, the building, through the lobby, so that the experience of sort of parking and entering the building is connected to that indoor space. Uh, and then uh, loading the, the resources of the building at the short end of the building, which is in the gray area. Keep going. The second floor um, of that space, very efficient. Next. Uh, very, again, hard to read elevations, but very low slung buildings uh, with, with good uh, materials de detail. Next. The shorter building, which is uh, adjacent to the restaurant, uh, the residential area. Go ahead next. Second floor, hard to read elevations. 
Um, and then the last building, which is similar to building C, is building uh, similar to building A. Keep going. Thank you. Okay, next. Now we're going to uh, look at some materials. Very important, I think, uh, we're, we're blending uh, an efficiency of, of concrete tilt-up buildings, but we're adding, infusing them with character at a human scale so that there's wood, there's uh, the perforated metal on the screen above, uh, and a, a complement of glass and light and dark materials we think are going to fit into the landscape that we are creating. Keep going. Similar materials on the, uh, the Alexandria with the uh, added introduction of the natural stone at key parts around the restaurant and adjacent to the, to the fitness center. Next. And we get to show you the fun stuff now. This is a rendering that shows, um, I wish I had my glasses. I'll look close on this little screen here. Okay, yeah, this is, this is a, a rendering um, of the, the Alexandria from uh, Rancho Caneo Boulevard showing the parking lot and the, the massing and the scale of how the building sort of sits on the site. Next. One of the facades that faces the, the perimeter. So you can see the introduction of, of the warm materials, the wood around the entry, the lower canopy uh, at, at the through lobby, and then the introduction of the wood materials within the facade where the windows are. Keep going. This shows you the arboretum and the context with the Alexandria in the background and the two buildings on the either side, and the variety of scale and spaces that are created by the landscape. Next. Landscape design. Uh, I'm, a, as I said, a lens, licensed landscape architect, and this is very important to me, and I've run out of, I've got three seconds left. Let me just say that we've, um, we've based the Arboretum on a, a concept uh, from a famous landscape architect and artist, Roberto Burley Marx, and it's really about creating a place through pattern, texture, and scale. Um, and you can see his, uh, the reference to his artwork and the inspiration for this space. And then we've infused that and carried it throughout the site. Keep going. Uh, Mr. Pomerecki, I'm yes. sorry. We're, we're at the end of our, That's okay. our time plus a little bit. We'll, we'll um, discuss some of the landscape in the, in the question session. We will. We yeah. will. Thank you. Thanks yes. very much. Um, you may want to stay up there. Commissioners may have questions. Um, are there questions of... Uh, of the applicant. Commissioner Buzz. All right, I guess I'll get us started. Uh, my first question is, um, I, I, uh, the last few projects I've seen of this nature, I was, uh, there, there was an emphasis on bicycle parking and uh, we're seeing electric bikes come out. Do we have a dedicated parking area for that kind of stuff? Yes, we do. It's part of the Alexandria facility. It's, it's adjacent to the fitness area. And part of that is uh, showers and lockers that go with that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Perfect. And, and then a second question about uh, basketball court. Yes. Is, is there a, a, a strong correlation between biotech and basketball? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a really great question. But the, we call it a basketball court, but the, the beauty of it, and we've done this in other areas around the country, that basketball court, if it's just a basketball court, is hardly ever used, right? So we curate and program it. We have uh, pickleball uh, on one night. It's stripes so that you can do badminton, volleyball, pickleball and basketball. But importantly, what we do is we curate a league. So a lot of our tenants have their own team ah. uh, and we pay for the ref so we generally win. But, um, uh, but what it does is again, it builds community. Um, and I think it brings people together. Unlike the tech industry, the life science industry is very collaborative and they come from a college environment and that's why we are inspired to create environments like this. Makes sense. I remember back when I still was able to play basketball. Amgen, I believe, had three teams <laughs> in the New Newbury Park League. Yeah. So, um, no, no, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I think that's all my questions at the moment. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, I, I don't mean this to sound mean, but it's the question I ask of all developers when they come before us. Um, do you intend to actually build this or just get the entitlements and sell it? Uh, yeah, no, we intend to build it. Um, we are a REIT, so, and we're public, so we are valued on our funds from operations. Uh, if we sell something, even at a massive gain, we get really no credit from the investment community. So it's all about building something and holding it in perpetuity. We do sell uh, things from time to time. It's generally to raise money to build something new, um, or we sell a partial interest in something we want to continue uh, to operate 
um, but use that capital for, again, new projects. But our intent is to fully build it and to hold it for, you know, long period of time, which would be, you know, 30, 40 years. And it seems from your other buildings that you're you're doing in the area that that's that's the intent. I just again, I, I didn't mean to be rude, but that's the question I ask everything because at the end of the day, it's frustrating as a commissioner to see half the things that you approve never actually get built. And this <laughs> is an amazing looking project, so I want to make sure that that's that's possible. Uh, when again, theoretically, would you be breaking ground, and how long would it take? Uh, we are um, like we do in all of our buildings. We're very uh, responsible not to build something that is not needed. So we will wait for an anchor tenant. Um, we believe that in the surrounding buildings that I walked through, that there will be one or two companies that will come out of there. Um, uh, one of the companies in 1300 Rancho Conejo is already over 40,000 square feet. Uh, they have some uh, programs that could potentially launch them into a huge growth mode and they could be our first tenant and that would you know if we could get someone to take half of building a that I think would launch us but until we have a, an anchor tenant we're just gonna stand pat until we can get one and again asking for somewhat speculation obviously but how long do you think phase one would take once <clears throat> you got started probably 24 months um, oh. from breaking ground that's actually quick, quicker than I thought um, I'd ask staff, but I'll ask you as well, is there an intent to open up phase one um, before phase two is completed? Yes. Um, I mean, if, if we're fortunate enough to get a, a, a company that could take so much space, <laughs> that could take so much space that um, even after we built phase one, there would, you know, we will look at it and say, hey, is there is there a possibility there could be more coming shortly? It would it would probably push us to build the whole thing at once. But we just want to be careful and not oversupply the market with space that's not needed. And obviously that's expensive to carry. I, I noticed um, looking at the materials again, there was a, a dedicated outreach program. Um, I don't know. People are going to speak here. I'm having mic problems as well. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> what kind of came about by virtue of that outreach program? Well, we um, we had two meetings. One was a, a general public meeting that we uh, presented the project to the neighbors and listened to their concerns and tried to address those specifically. But we felt like uh, what was really needed was a follow up. So we had a, a meeting at one of the residents' houses to actually see what the problems uh, or the issues were and had proposed um, a, different than the plan that you su saw. We doubled the number of trees along the perimeter, the entire perimeter. The initial goal was to go, okay, where are the specific issues, the holes that we need to fill? And it just seemed more appropriate to sort of create the, a double row of, of, of oak trees at the perimeter to mitigate any sort of concerns. But I think there's still ongoing work to be done to make sure that that is followed through and, and we make sure that all the residents feel like they aren't sitting on top of, you know, or adjacent to a, something that they don't want to look at. Uh, the issue of the parking lot uh, adjacent to it, light, um, all those things, views of cars. So we're trying to layer the landscape to make sure that, you know, if we, if we live next door, what would we want? And I think that's important. Um, Now's the time we can think about it and get it right the first time rather than do something and have a reaction to it. So, but we, the, the residents have been fantastic in the, in the conversation, uh, given us some great ideas and you know, we've, we've implemented. Uh, I, I think Mr. Cole, it's indicated the one letter we did get was ultimately followed up by, by your team. How, well, how did that go? If you know. <laughs> and again, just for process sake, I ask that you state your name and city of residence. I'm Diane McKay from here from Thousand Oaks. Um, when I spoke to the resident that in that particular case, they, their concern is where the, pi the debris piles are. And so we're still going to have ongoing conversations about that, that and how the debris is going to be held down because we have drought issues. So kind of water, the traditional thing is not a good idea. So they're looking at some alternative ideas. Okay. Uh, and then my last question here is, and again, it's probably, uh, I'm assuming the answer, but are you okay with all the conditions that are part of the package? Is there anything that you are, are have a problem with? If, if, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. I, I don't think we have any issue with any of the conditions. 
Okay, yeah. thank you, nothing further. Thank you. Commissioner Link. I just had one question and I don't mean to look a gift horse in the mouth, but uh, uh, why not lead platinum versus gold? <laughs> uh, it's just a, a, a large cost premium and we're trying to get the cost down as much as possible. We have found that the rents that we could achieve here are not as high as we could achieve in other areas where it would cost the same. And we, we really want to build it, but it has to be economically feasible. So sacrifices such as that had to be made. Makes total sense. That's all I had. Thank you. I just have a few questions. Um, what, in, in general, what, what is biotech specific about the, the buildings you built? <clears throat> so the, a good way of um, thinking about it is uh, I can contrast it to an office building. So in an office building, let's start with HVAC. The building, the air comes in, it's cooled or heated, and it circulates. And it's usually changed out maybe once or twice an hour. In a biotech building, the air comes in, heated or cooled, and then it exits immediate or you know, it, one time. It does not recirculate. So we change the air anywhere from eight to 12 times an hour. And that's because there are you know, fumes and things that are in the lab, so it's, it's safe. Electricity wise, uh, a typical office building may supply four to five watts per square foot. We supply about 20 to 25 watts per square foot because of the equipment that's in the lab uh, uses that much energy. Um, plumbing. Uh, a, uh, an office building will have a domestic water supply, potable water. We usually have two plumbing systems, one for um, the industrial side, the, the drainage um, from the lab sinks, and then potable water like you would see in a lab. Oh, I miss? Uh, the other characteristic is that um, if you think about the, the building itself, it's composed of about half of it is office, it's a traditional office, and the other half is pure lab science. So we call that about a 50-50 ratio. So that's what makes up a research, research and development building. So if you can think about it that way, that uh, it's sort of, you know, half office, half lab. And that ratio changes depending on the tenant, whether it's 60-40 or 50-50. Uh, Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I know that, that we're talking about, the, in talking about these types of facilities, we're talking about R&D that's done by very highly skilled people, by biologists, chemists, biochemists, physicists, <coughs> statisticians. Um, people are really at the top of the professional chain. But of course, even these highly technical companies need fairly large support staffs as well. Mm -hmm. And my question is, and, and it touches on housing here, um, do you have a ballpark sense of what ratio you have to your researchers versus your support staff for, for tenants that might, might be going into these buildings? <clears throat> well, l let me first say that um, one of the nice things about this industry is that there is a wide spectrum um, of education. Uh, a lot of people immediately think of the PhDs, um, the highly technical uh, skill set, but um, someone can graduate from high school and then take a junior college class and learn how to be a lab tech. So you don't even have to have a four-year degree to work in the lab, which, which we find you know, to be a great thing for the community in general. Uh, if you're talking about administrative personnel, there's not a lot because these are not headquarters buildings where those types of legal or accounting functions take place. It's really just pure research. Pure R and D. So there'll be some there'll be some techs, as I mentioned, folks that work in the lab that um, uh, are doing pipetting from uh, you know one tube to another as they set up an experiment, uh, and then there'll be some lab operations people that are in charge of safety ordering supplies, things like that, I would guess, and it is just a guess, about 10% of the staff might be in, in that range, and then the rest are hardcore research. I appreciate that. I mean, where I was going with this is that, as I'm sure you know, um, our greatest unmet housing need is for that research technician or that support staff. 
And I just want to be sure we're not adding to what's already an overburdened stock here by that. But it doesn't sound as if you're, you're saying 10 percent, which is not a huge number. No, but it would be nice if they could live near the lab as well. Agreed. And, <laughs> yeah. and our existing biotechs yeah. are telling us that. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, one of the things that drew us to this area is the fact that you can have a nice house you can own and, you know, be a lab tech. Um, right. Very rare, probably not really feasible in any other place we do business. Yeah. Right. Well, we want to continue to grow our economy so we can do that. But we need to be mindful of providing housing for for everyone there. Great. Uh, I think that's all I had. Let me just check, please. Ah, yeah, one, one more question following up on Commissioner Lanson's. You, you indicated you're, you're in this for the long run, and I appreciate that. Is there any potential, though, for, we're, we're talking about two phases here. Is there any potential that phase two doesn't happen, that that, that second I, I think it's building C doesn't doesn't get built. I I never say never. So yeah, there is a potential that mm -hmm. uh, that things stall, um, and the what brought us here, which you know, frankly, was the creation of a new venture capital fund focused in the area. If they decided to disband, there there would be very you know, all of a sudden a huge company creation engine would shut down. We just might not have the demand for it. Sure. And, and the, I understand this is very hypothetical, worst case uh, modeling, but do I, is it, is it right that the, would the pad be built for that building C as part of phase one or, or would it just be undeveloped? We're going to have all the pads ready. It'll be pad, pad ready. So, if, if it never got built, there would be a nice pad there for hopefully something else. Okay, use. very good. And Gr one smaller note, the, the building C is inter interior to the site adjacent to ind other industrial properties. So I think from a, a community perspective, it, very minimal impact uh, as to the perception of the project. Minimal visual impact exactly. in terms of, yeah. Very good. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we go uh, next to public comment. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. um, we had one written speaker card, um, which was generally favorable toward the applicant. It indicated um, constructive conversation with the, with the applicant. And we tonight have six public speakers, uh, four of whom are here in person, and two are um, with us remotely. So I will split it up by doing two, one, two, one. Let's do it that way. So we'll start with our in-person speakers. Um, we first have Frank Ladwig, followed by Danielle Borgia, and then um, Adam Haverstock, who's remote. So Mr. Ladwig, um, if you would come to the dais. Again, we ask that you give your name and city of residence. And if you would state if you have any financial interest in this project, and you have four minutes for your comments. Good evening, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm Frank Ladwig. I live in Rancho Conejo. Uh, lived there for 12 years, approximately, and in the county for a little over 20 years. Um, I am um, pleased to be here today because um, I feel like. Um, uh, Alexandria has uh, reached out to the community uh, from the get-go. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we were invited to get together and hear some of the ideas for the project uh, in advance and um, letting us know that uh, our input was going to be uh, receptive and uh, looked forward to. So that was a good beginning. And um, as you've heard, the... Uh, the whole process and the whole idea of uh, biotech in this area is a positive one. Um, the options of um, uh, the uh, concerns, uh, one of one uh, that came up originally was the, uh, the elevation of the uh, 
of the project and the uh, initial landscaping or uh, grading. And there was some concern about headlights coming into the community and um, into the, the actual homes along the perimeter. And uh, so that was addressed and uh, uh, I don't know, a month or so later, we had uh, new drawings where the elevation had changed and they had graded down uh, to accommodate for that so that the headlights would not actually go over the wall. And uh, so that was some, uh, a concern. By the way, uh, just off the topic for a moment, uh, pickleball players are a rabid group from what I've been <laughs> <laughs> experienced even bumper stickers now uh, advocate who they are. Um, so all I would like to have on the record is that uh, it's nice to have uh, basketball and badminton and pickleball and whatever inside the, uh, the building. But let me go on record that uh, playing pickleball, if they advocate for something to be used in the vacant uh, driveway or parking lot, is not to be accepted uh, because the sound of pickleball players goes a long, long way, and that would drive virtually everyone out of uh, Rancho Conejo. So just let me put that in the record. Um, the second thing that came up that was really important to us was the, uh, uh, the tree situation. And, and uh, the idea of having uh, different layers of trees, which is what uh, uh, has been presented tonight uh, is is a major statement of of uh, recognizing, you know, the proximity of residences with this this whole project, uh, and so I I encourage uh, people to follow through with that. Um, the dust mitigation and um, has been very good. The the uh, uh, the question of water, particularly the situation of uh, water usage now uh, is really required to have that kind of uh, uh, demolition going on right next door to us and also any excavation that's in the project. So I encourage everyone to stop and, and think about how they can continue to do that. I think the fencing and the trees are really important. A uh, consideration I have is that there seems to have been some kind of a, a survey taken where they put up uh, uh, chain link fences along the whole perimeter, and there's a, a distance between the, the chain link fence and the wall for Rancho Conejo. So there's like, uh, in, in my backyard, there's like four feet between their chain link fence that they put in and the wall. That's Good, like thank you, no Mr. Ludwig, thank you. Mitigate that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Take care of that, thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Danielle Borgia followed by Adam Haverstock. Good evening, Ms. Borgia. Good evening, Chair Newman and Planning Commissioners. Danielle Borgia, President CEO of the Greater Conejo Valley Chamber of Commerce and also a Thousand Oaks resident. Um, Alexandra is a current member of our Chamber of Commerce, and I'm here tonight on behalf of our Board of Directors to express strong support of this proposal. As our city continues to focus on the growth of the biotech sector, this 19-acre campus will be a transformative project that will repurpose existing industrial zone land and provide high-wage jobs for our community. You heard tonight that Alexandria has already had a proven record in Thousand Oaks as a partner in developing multiple visibly aging buildings into attractive locations that employ hundreds of employees. I personally had the opportunity to walk the site um, with Peter and his team earlier in this year, and they really have an amazing vision that you've heard here tonight. Um, between the amenities, the garden, which I would personally love to spend some time in, um, the collaboration and the buildings are inspired by the mid-century architecture of the local Eichler homes. And this also aligns with many of the investments being made by our local business community and higher education partners. Cal Lutheran just recently completed their 50,000 square feet and $34 million science center. Moorpark College is on the cusp of offering their first four-year degree program, which is in bio biotech manufacturing. <laughs> In our hospitality sector, the Palm Garden just recently redid their hotel and are working on their restaurant with nearly a $10 million investment in their property, which is approximately a mile from the campus. 
We have four recent housing projects that are going to be building um, in the near future with also the anticipated opening of 299 on the boulevard. And all combined with strong support from our local industry partners, including Westlake Village Bio Partners and major employers like Achara Biotherapeutics. And the city's own investment in the recently approved sidewalk project in Rancho Conejo to create a more pedestrian friendly environment for local employees. Simply put, this campus is a significant economic development opportunity with quality developer that will create high wage jobs and support also our existing surrounding businesses. We strongly urge the commission to support this project this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next up uh, via teleconference is Adam Haverstock. Thank you, Chair Newman and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Adam Haverstock. I am the Director of Government Affairs and Tourism for the Greater Conejo Valley Chamber of Commerce. I'm here tonight to reiterate our organization's support for this project proposed by Alexandria Real Estate. We submitted a letter from the Chamber of Commerce to that effect this morning. This project was recently reviewed by our board of directors. Our board members expressed excitement about this project and what it means for the future growth of the life sciences hub in the Rancho Conejo area. In particular, we are lucky to have a company like Alexandria Real Estate developing projects in Conejo Valley. They are known nationally for creating beautiful, high quality facilities. Also, they don't flip the property and sell it off. They personally own and manage the projects they develop so we know they will be invested in our community for the long haul. Finally, I wanted to mention that this project will help meet the long-term goals of the City of Thousand Oaks. Projects like the one proposed tonight are the types of developments needed to attract another Amgen to Thousand Oaks or to grow smaller life science companies to a similar prestige. Please vote to support this project tonight and help create a strong future local economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haverstock. We move next to Mark Sattler, then Judy Grund, and Jeremy Clement. Mr. Sattler, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mark Sattler, Newberry Park. I've lived in Rancho Canelo for 27 years uh, and live on a trail of the street that's most affected. Um, and this is also includes a, a letter from my neighbor, David Fate, um, lives across the street whose backyard is bordering the affected property. Uh, I'd like to commend uh, Mustang Marketing and Alexandria for listening to us homeowners. They did, as far as the grading and the landscaping to help mitigate some of those things. The only, my concern is we just lived through four months worth of demolition uh, and pounding and, but the problem, they would start before the seven o'clock and you know, 6.30 in the morning and it's not a fun way to work, wake up. So with uh, 60, 70 truck trips a day, I was in the transportation industry for 42 years, so I'm used to that. But we don't need to have it start if we're gonna get that many trips in in a day before that seven o'clock time. That's my really concern. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Ms. Uh, Judy Grund, followed by uh, Jeremy Klemek. Good evening, Ms. Grund. Hi. Good evening. Um, my name is Judy Grund, and I've lived in the neighborhood in Rancho Conejo for 28 years. I live right on the corner um, where the trees are still up, and I'm wondering if they're going to be removing those really giant trees which cover what's going on right now, for me, anyway. And I can't imagine them putting trees in there that are going to be as large as the trees that are there now. Um, so that is one of my concerns. Also the noise. Uh, they do, it's supposed to start at seven o'clock, but sometimes I hear them, the trucks backing up, beep, 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 at 6.30. And Right now they're working, they don't work on Saturday and Sundays. Are they going to be doing that once they start building? And also I'm concerned about the, the lights in the parking lot. How close are they going to be to my house? And the park, the, um, 
the cars that are going to be coming back and forth? Are the lights going to shine into my house? Because I have two floors, and I want to make sure that they're not going to reach my bedroom when I'm trying to sleep. So those are my concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I believe that's all the public. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do. I, and my apologies to Jeremy Klemek. Are you there, Mr. Klemek? Uh, I'm here. I'm with the landscape architects on the project. So I have absolutely no objections. But thank you for letting me speak. I was just here to answer any questions. Very good. Do we have any other public speakers? Not hearing of any. I think we're all set then to go back to staff for comments, follow up comments and responses. So Chair Newman, I'll, I'll jump into that first and I'll see if my colleagues have any other items to uh, respond to. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I think it's pretty clear that the applicant team did a really good job of, of outreach in general. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to commend them for that because not all of our applicants do do that. Um, but in particular, in terms of uh, some uh, uh, questions on the project, um, I really only heard three. So in terms of removing trees and the replacement of trees, and are they gonna be the same size for what's there today? The short answer is no, they're not gonna be uh, the same size as the existing trees, but they're going to be able to grow into that site uh, or into those sizes as time goes on. Uh, the applicant team, to their credit, are planting larger trees than we otherwise would require, so there's a jump start on getting to that full maturity. In terms of construction hours, there were some concerns about that. 7, out, 7 a.m. is the start time, so it should not be happening before then. If that does occur, uh, contact city staff um, is what I would say. Um, and the applicant team has, um, through Mustang Marketing, has um, also been a, a point of contact uh, for you through this whole process. So those would be the two places to begin with. Uh, but the expectation is uh, no earlier than 7 o'clock. Um, the construction hours per the city's uh, municipal code does allow Saturday work. Um, but talking to the applicant team, that is not their intention um, as we move forward. It really is a Monday through Friday um, scenario where Saturday work may occur um, is if there's a weather event and they're trying to catch up with something for a day that they otherwise would not be allowed to work on. Uh, those sort of um, um, thought processes are, are in their portfolio and, and mindset. Um, and the last uh, comment was uh, essentially concern about uh, vehicle lights shining into rear uh, properties. Um, the project as conditioned um, and the intent of the applicant as we heard, uh, they've been working with the applicant team, uh, with, with neighbors to make sure that parked vehicles aren't going to be shining into rear yards. Um, and that's through a combination of perimeter walls and landscaping and, and other effects. Um, par parking lots shining into upper floors. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that scenario necessarily would be happening, but tree canopies should help <laughs> mitigate that as we uh, see the development of the entire project. Um, but I would say that the applicant team has uh, attempted to self-mitigate that, and there's project conditions specifically regarding parked vehicles not being able to shine into rear properties. Um, I don't see anything else from my colleagues here in terms of other comments. Thank you. Commissioners, are there follow-up questions of staff? Commissioner Link. I just had one question, and I know we're dealing in semantics here, but uh, and is this the most appropriate time? I'm wondering for this. Um, but anyway, we'll get, throw it out there and we'll see. Um, I, I noticed in the uh, resolution uh, on approval period use inauguration, is that date of three years for the permit uh, based on deemed complete or tonight's hearing? Uh, it should be based on tonight's hearing, uh, and, and I think you might have saw the same thing that we saw. It's it says October, October 14th 14th. instead of November. Correct. It should say November 14th in okay. condition number three. All right. Excellent. And, and I have uh, that, and we will, um, when whomever makes a motion, we will note that we'll modify condition three to indicate that the start date is today. 
So the end date would be November 14th, 2025. That's correct. Right. I just had one, one follow-up question on noise complaints. Um, where would residents go in, in city government to, to voice those complaints? Is it code compliance? Do you want to put in a plug for the new TO24 system? <laughs> yeah, Chair Newman, uh, our city's code compliance division who can respond to the noise complaints. Um, and we, you can call any of our staff and the staff will put them in connect, connection with someone. Very good, thank you. And for, for residents and anyone who's complaining, whether it's, it's noise in this project or any other violation of city laws and regulation, the code compliance department can be reached on the city's website or their phone number is 805-449-2300. And they're very responsive to, to uh, and they do follow up when there are complaints. Are there any other staff comments before we go back to the applicant? If you wish, you have five minutes to rebut um, and make any follow-up comments if you wish um, or not, but we want to give you that opportunity if, if you feel you need additional time. Uh, the only thing we want to do is uh, apologize that work started at 6.30. We were not aware of that until now. So we're going to work with Turner. Up, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So our contractor is here, and <laughs> they've heard that. So um, we'll make sure that, again, we, we, we think of things like if we live next to you, what would we want? And believe me, when my neighbor's building too early, I talk, talk to him about yeah. it. So thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, and, and the other issue of, of lights, um, one thing we did mention is the, the lights for the parking lot are shielded so that they don't shine toward the residents, they shine into the project. Uh, that's the lighting of the parking lot. So uh, again, I think the important thing is us to continue the dialogue that we've had because it's, it's beneficial for all of us and we appreciate your feedback and we can't solve the problems unless we, we know what they are and we're here to do that. So we're a neighbor, so. Thank you. And one, th one thing I've been hearing just as a comment is, is that we've had positive comments both from residents and from Alexandria um, that there has been, seems that there has been dialogue and there have been good responses on both time, on both sides. So I compliment you both for there has engaging been indeed, in that. And it's made the project better, we think, so. Terrific. Thank you. Well, I, I compliment everyone involved for that, so thank you. Okay, are there any other questions of staff or the applicant before we close the public hearing? Not hearing any, I will go ahead and close the public hearing and open the floor for a motion or discussion. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Um, this was a privilege uh, to see that discussion right there, by the way. That was fantastic. And thank you for engaging with the community. The public outreach, as Chair Newman said, was actually exactly what we want to see. That was great. Um, I, I am motivated by a number of different issues looking at these types of things. Initially, we have a very limited amount of space in our city. Uh, so we have to look for strategic repurposing of uh, various properties that we can to provide its best and, and you know, best use. Um, I also like, uh, as some of you may know from my saying it over and over again, I like experience-based projects. Not, we're not a goods economy, we're not a service economy, we're an experience-based economy. And I cannot think of a better experience-based project than the one that I've seen tonight. Uh, that combines so many different elements. Uh, pickleball included, which <laughs> is a, a fad that I'm, I'm not fully understanding yet, but it's obviously huge. And uh, I think Stephen Colbert has a pickle special coming up in terms of a tournament. Um, but it just combines so many different elements of an experience-based process where I'm thinking of going and becoming a scientist. I think I missed my <laughs> calling. 
Um, I think I, I missed being a lawyer. I should, I should be assigned so I can work at this, this building. So no, it, it satisfies that issue in terms of trying to provide an experience-based process. It repurposes a property that right now is obviously not being used to its best extent. You've engaged the community. You've found ways to promote the process. It'll provide jobs for lots of our, our people looking to find good, good paying jobs here and kind of ignite that biotech industry that we're trying to create. So I, I, I see so many great positives here about this process. So. I will go ahead and make the motion. I'm scared exactly what I'm supposed to end up saying here. Um, I will then recommend Planning Commission adopt the mitigated negative declaration in accordance with CEQA and approve the below listed requests based on the findings and subject to the recommended conditions of approval, including attachment four, subject to the modification of condition three uh, that we talked about in terms of the date. Do I have to say more than that, Mr. Heer? I think you have it there. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Is there a discussion on this, Commissioner Buzz? Um, I, I have to concur with uh, Mr. Lanson's assessment. I think this is a wonderful project. I think that there's been great synergy between the neighbors and the uh, project managers. Um, I have been following you since I first drove by one of your projects and thought, oh, is that a new church in town? And then I found out who you actually are. Um, I am excited as a longtime resident that uh, we're talking about the next Amgen uh, coming out of one of these because uh, I remember I was a bit too young for the actual Amgen experience, but a lot of my friends' parents were amongst the first 100 employees of Amgen. So these companies do exist, they do happen, and uh, what that did for our community, whatever you guys build and house could end up doing for the community for the next 40 years. So thank you very much for the project, and I definitely support it. Thank you. Commissioner Link. Thank you, Chair Newman. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of these projects. I think the differentiation, though, is whether we see a good project or an okay project or a great project, and I think this is actually turning out to be a great project. I, again, I reiterate uh, what my colleagues have said about the collaboration between you. Uh, one of the things that I'm a strong proponent of is context-sensitive solutions, and certainly you have been very context-sensitive. I understand there's a lot of turmoil and and noise that comes along with construction, and that is certainly disruptive, but uh, hopefully is temporary. This shouldn't be a project that lasts for 10 years. If it does, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about it. Uh, but going forward, uh, it sounds like the applicant is willing to make as many concessions as possible and try to keep their, uh, their uh, contractors in line for you. Uh, but this is a, a great looking project. Uh, I did have to look up Mr. Marks and, and uh, it turns out he actually designed the boardwalk at the Copacabana Beach. Uh, I don't necessarily see that influence on this project, but certainly some of his other projects. Uh, but again, beautiful project. Uh, and again, makes the difference between these infill type redevelopments and making a great project. So I commend you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll join the course of commendation here in noting that Life sciences is one of the economic engines of our community. And I think you're doing something that will continue to drive that engine and make it run even better and perform even stronger than it currently is. And I commend you for that. I commend you for working with, with residents who have quite valid concerns. You know, as, as the applicant themselves noted, no one wants to live next to a construction project. It's not fun. Um, we, we've all been there, and there are disruptions. Um, I wish there were a perfect way to build a quite handsome, high-quality project like this without removing any trees. That's not possible. What we have here is, is contention not between um, the good and the perfect, but between the really excellent, well done, and the perfect. And that's a nice problem to have um, so well you know, no project uh, comes without trade-offs. I think the, the trade-offs here are minimal and the benefits are so numerous and um, so proven, so well proven here that, that I'm delighted to see that Alexander is choosing Thousand Oaks to do this here and I'll, I will join my other commissioners in supporting this and in wishing you well in getting that anchor tenant and continuing to grow our life science business here. So with that, I will ask the secretary to prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Russ? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4-0, Councilmember McMahon absent. 
This is an appealable project, so I should note that any aggrieved party who wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision may do so by filing an appeal with the Community Development Department within 10 days. Again, my thanks for choosing Thousand Oaks. At this point, I'd like to call a brief recess. Um, it's about 7.55. Let's return here at 8.05.
for this case for seven years. And we are back. I will ask the secretary please to open hearing uh, 7B on our agenda this evening. Hearing having been advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 7B, Wireless Communications Facility WCF 2022-70729 to allow the installation of a wireless communications facility at an existing park consisting of antennas and radio equipment on a new support structure, equipment, cabinets, and emergency generator within a storage building that will be expanded. Also to find the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, as both a class one and class three categorical categorical exemption pursuant to section 15301 existing facilities and section 15303 new construction of the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA guidelines located uh, at 1350 East Jans Road and APN 677-0-100-165 the applicant is Yukon Group on behalf of Dish Wireless LLC. Thank you, and presenting on behalf of staff this evening is Assistant Planner Tabitha McAtee. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Newman, members of the Planning Commission. The project before you tonight is a request to allow installation of a wireless communications facility at an existing park consisting of antennas and radio equipment on a new support structure equipment cabinets and emergency generator within a storage building that will be expanded. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission finds the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA as class one and class three categorical exemptions and to adopt a resolution approving WCF 2022-70729. In the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code, in the permitted non-residential use matrix, a request for a new wireless communications facility in an industrial, I'm sorry, institutional zoned area requires planning commission approval of a special use permit. This project is located within an area zoned PL or public lands, quasi-public and institutional lands and facilities zone. The project site is bound by a Conejo Valley Unified School District property on, the Jan on Jans Road to the north, California 23 Highway to the west, and a residential zoned area to the east and south. These surrounding developed properties are zoned PL and RO, or single family estate zones. And the proposed facility is located within the Conejo Creek South Park. Here is an aerial map showing the subject properties outlined in red and the subject site towards the bottom of the screen. I'm sorry, towards the top of the screen. The blue circle shows the location of the proposed site and the yellow circle shows the location of the existing wireless communications facility, which is a T-Mobile site at the Caneo Creek South Park. The existing storage building is located in between these sites at the edge of the existing parking lot, and the nearest residence is located approximately 900 feet away on the opposite side of the playing fields. Staff did receive 10 citizen inquiries during the required notice of application period. Most of those inquiries were general questions, including design and location. All of the inquiries were answered by staff. The project consists of three panel antennas, radio units, a surge suppressor, a hybrid cable, and a GPS antenna located inside a new monopole with radome, an associated equipment cabinet and emergency generator within an existing canal recreation and park district storage building. The existing storage building is 742 square feet and consists of park storage space and wireless communications equipment owned by another wireless carrier. The proposed 751 square foot expansion to the existing storage building is to accommodate the new equipment and generator associated with the proposed monopole. The proposed monopole location is on an existing concrete pad adjacent to the CRPD parking lot 
approximately 660 feet south of Jans Road, and the existing storage building is located approximately 135 feet southwest of the proposed monopole. The applicant has provided an alternate sites analysis that provided two alternate properties. One is west of the proposed site across the 23 highway at a religious facility and research center. And the second location is northeast of the proposed site at another PL zoned property immediately adjacent to the Thousand Oaks Library. Both sites were eliminated because of the desired radio frequency signal coverage could not be achieved. Both sites are located within closer proximity to residential properties than the proposed site. The new freestanding wireless telecommunications facility would have to be would have to be proposed and the proposed design for each site would have would have been a faux tree with antennas. And here is a propagation map also provided by the applicant showing the proposed coverage for the new facility. And here is the map that shows the overall propagation for DISH's network, including the project site. City Council has adopted resolution number 97-197, which regulates the approval, location, and design of wireless communications antennas and facilities. This resolution affects all proposed wireless communications facilities within the city's jurisdiction. A wireless communication facility may be approved with a special use permit in the PL zone provided that the use is compatible with the present uses on site and with the adjoining uses and the design will not have an unreasonably detrimental visual impact on the neighboring residents. Section 4B 2B states that wireless antennas may be allowed in PL zones if the proposal is not within a ridgeline area on a hilltop or on a hillside the proposed monopole is located within a level parking area of a public park. There is currently tall vegetation screening um, the proposed monopole and existing wireless site from public view on the adjacent highway looking towards Conejo Creek South Park. And additionally, the other wireless carrier that is currently located on the property is installed with a more visually intrusive method. Here is the overall site plan of the proposed wireless communications facility. Both the freestanding monopole and expanded building for the new equipment is located in the dashed area towards the center of the screen. And here is an enlarged site plan showing the addition area of the CRPD storage building and the plan view of the freestanding monopole. Both are located along the existing sidewalk bordering the Canal Creek South Park's parking lot. The application proposes three six-foot panel antennas enclosed within a partially meshed radome at a three-foot, four-inch diameter on top of a two-foot wide support pole. The new radio units, surge suppressor, and GPS antenna will be located inside the monopole enclosure beneath the antennas. The entire monopole structure is proposed at 54 feet high and does not exceed the heights of existing field lights, which are all 60 feet high. Any exposed element of the proposed wireless facility will be painted to match the support structure. The equipment cabinets and emergency generator will be installed inside the expanded storage building and will not be within public view. Here are the northeast elevations. The existing is on top and the proposed on bottom. And you can see here that the monopole height is 54 feet high at the top of the support structure. And here are the southeast elevations showing the expanded storage building area on the right side of the building in the proposed section. The next few slides show the project's photo simulations provided by the applicant. These photos show how the monopole would look from the parking lot at three different viewpoints. Uh. 
And this view, number one, is looking east towards the subject site. You can see the monopole in the bottom left corner area of the screen. View two, looking northeast towards the subject site, and it's about, it's towards the middle of your screen being pointed out. <coughs> And view number three, looking northwest towards the subject site. Also, the freeway is behind the vegetation you see on the right of the screen, and the monopole is in front of that. And here are the photos showing the view from the freeway. The expanded storage building and proposed monopole will not be visible from the freeway or freeway off-ramp with the existing vegetation in place. The proposed emergency generator would provide power to the facility in the event of a power outage. This unit would have monthly tests to ensure proper operation, to ensure minimal disturbance to, near, to nearby residents. Staff proposes a condition limiting testing times between 2 and 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, in the proposed planning commission resolution. And on to our technical review for evaluation, the city's wireless communications consultant, Jonathan Kramer of Telecom Law Firm PC, reviewed the submitted radio frequency report and suggested the conditions that will promote planned compliance with FCC guidelines. These conditions are included in the proposed planning commission resolution. And Dr. Kramer is with us now via Zoom. And if he would like to take this time to provide his technical review presentation. Very good, Dr. Kramer, are you with us? Good evening, Mr. Chair, good to see you and commissioners, Dr. Jonathan Kramer. I am the city's technical advisor and have had that privilege of advising the city on wireless matters all the way back to its first cell site. Uh, the project before you is the deployment of a brand new wireless system. Dish Wireless has uh, secured licenses from the FCC, and as part of the T-Mobile Sprint merger, DISH is coming in now as the new competitor. So they're building out their network for the first time in Thousand Oaks. Uh, that's consistent with the deployment map that you saw earlier. We reviewed the project for compliance with 97197, as well as the FCC's rules for RF safety. The project complies and as to RF safety, the project complies because the antennas themselves are above a minimum height that the FCC has determined to be categorically exempt. Um, the project is straightforward from an RF and technical standpoint. The only real recommendation that we had besides our usual conditions is that there was an opportunity to uh, put the CRPD logo on the radome uh, so to better blend that element into the park. I'm available for your questions and I look forward to them. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Ms. McAtee, are there any additional items from staff or is that is that it? I'll just wrap up my, Please my presentation. Do. Thank you, Dr. Sorry. Kramer and Chair Newman. And for environmental review, this project was analyzed for conformance with the CEQA with the CEQA guidelines, it has been determined that the proposed project is categorically exempt from the provisions of CEQA pursuant, pursuant to Class 1, Section 15301, Existing Facilities, and Class 3, Section 15303, New Construction. This request involves an installation of a new wireless communications support structure at an existing park with no expansion of the use. And the proposed project includes the installation of a wireless communications facility at an existing park consisting of antennas and radio equipment on a new support structure, equipment, cabinet, and emergency generator within an expanded storage building in a public lands zone. Additionally, the Community Development Department has further determined that none of these six exemptions to the use of the category exemptions apply to this project. The applicant has demonstrated the need for this site to provide wireless communications services 
to the intended area of coverage. The project site provides the best signal propagation and least intrusive means of installation. Conditions are imposed to promote plan compliance with the FCC guidelines. Approval of this project as conditioned would be in compliance with the requirements of the city's standards and design guidelines for the installation of wireless communications facilities and would not have a detrimental impact on the surrounding neighborhood. Staff is therefore recommending that the Planning Commission finds the project exempt from CEQA as a class one and class three categorical, categorical exemption and to adopt a resolution approving WCF 2022-70729 based on the findings and subject to the conditions of the proposed Planning Commission resolution. City staff and the applicant's representative and the city's wireless consultant, Dr. Kramer, are all available for questions. And I do have one housekeeping item to address. The APN on the um, project packet and the public notice has a typo. The APN should read 677, not 670. So it should read APN 677-0-100-165. Um, the correct properties were shaded in the public hearing notice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McAtee, for your presentation. Um, before I go to commissioners for questions, I'd like to bring Dr. Kramer back for just a moment, if we may. It's been a while since we've had a wireless case before us, and I think it would be helpful to hear from Dr. Kramer about what we can and cannot do here. What, what is our brief, um, particularly around the matters of health and safety? Dr. Kramer? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The federal rules are very clear on point, which is that the city has the authority and has always uh, used it to determine whether a project complies with the federal regulations as to health, uh, this specifically being radio frequency emissions health. Congress has told us that we can do that. The FCC and Congress have said, as long as it complies, with those federal regulations, then that's the end of our exploration. One of the questions that we always answer, explore and answer in our reviews of projects is to determine whether a project as proposed does comply with the FCC rules. Um, in most cases, applicants in Thousand Oaks have had enough experience to know that they're gonna be closely checked. And in this case, the applicant knows this very well, the city and uh, they've submitted a project that does comply. So in terms of RF safety, that question is a question of whether a project complies. The fundamental question about health and safety is reserved to the FCC and Congress. It's not a question that we deal with at the local level or even at the state level. Again, the Congress and the FCC have said, if the emissions comply with the FCC's national guidelines, that is the answer to that question. And while not a complete answer for residents, that is the state of the law. So uh, the rest of this then gets down to compliance with uh, 97, 197, the other city's uh, codes and regulations, and all of the applicable safety codes that have to be met as well uh, to construct a project. Mr. Chair, I, I hope that's kind of a scoping answer to your question. Very much so. Thank you, Dr. Kramer, for bringing us uh, up to date on what is and is not in scope for, for this hearing. And with that, I'll go to my fellow commissioners for any questions of staff. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Um, and thanks, Ms. McEntee, for the report, and Mr. Kramer, or Dr. Kramer as well. Um, I get asked, always this question, is this a 4G or a 5G tower? I will defer to the applicant. Okay, we can wait for them to come up. Um, I think the indication was that um, this was a, is it T-Mobile that's expanding its network by virtue of these applications or? Dish. Dish. It's Those Dish two? Wireless. Dish, okay. Mm -hmm. And from the other applications, it looks like they're, they're putting a lot by the 23 freeway. So I'm assuming that's the area that they're saying is deficient, that they need these, these new antennas? Yes. Um, and Dr. Kramer did just go through it and I was looking at the 
staff report, which has the uh, statute that we have with regard to what we're, our review is, and it does have health and safety, but as Dr. Kramer's pointing out, that doesn't include, I guess, by virtue of uh, the health and safety of citizens by the RF. It's, it's health and safety, I'm assuming, in terms of its construction. Would that be accurate? That is accurate. Um, I know there were some comments you said that were made, um, uh, but you said most of the responses were in terms of location and other things. Um, was there any specifically with regard to its construction or concerns about not just the health, but other issues that were within our purview? If you know Ms. McAtee. Most of the comments were regarding the location. So I guess the notice was a little confusing. They thought it was gonna be in the center of the field. Um, I specified where it was gonna be, um, that it was not up against the homes on the other side of the playing fields. So most of the people were okay with that, with the location. And another question that came up a lot was, what is it gonna look like? So I described it and offered each person to go over the plans with them at the front counter. Um, nobody took me up on that offer, so I just answered their questions over the phone. As I recall, from the, the ones we've had before, our, our usual our review is limited to aesthetics, uh, which in this situation would be, I guess, having it look like a palm tree or uh, some other kind of issue, but this seems to be actually very nominal in terms of its look. Um, that's all the questions I have. Very good, thank you. Commissioner Link, any questions? Um, Let's see, I think all the questions I have are, well, with one exception are, are for the applicant, but the one question I do have is I just, I just wanna confirm that there is another cellular site in operation at this location uh, right now, is that correct? Yes, it is a T-Mobile site and it is a field light that has a canister under the lighting. So that is actually higher than the proposed project. It's over 54 feet high. Right, and it's on a different, it's on an existing pole. It's on its, on its own field light pole, yes, and it's on the other side of the storage building that's being expanded. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are no other questions from commissioners, we will go to our applicant and we have with us tonight representing the applicant is Adrian Colucci. Um, thank you. Uh, who is the site acquisition planner for Yukon Group representing uh, Dish Wireless. Um, Mr. Colucci, we ask that you come to the lectern and uh, state your name and city of residence and you have up to 15 minutes for your presentation. Good evening. Good evening. Uh Chair Newman and members of the Planning Commission. Again, my name is Adrian Colici. I reside in Temple City and I work for an architecture and engineering firm called uh, Yukon Group and we represent Dish Wireless. Um, for, for the record, I'd like to state that we have read and agreed to the conditions of approval and uh, I'd like to thank staff and Dr. Kramer for their presentation. Um, and given that we have four sites to get through tonight, I'll keep my comments brief and reserve my time for qu any questions you or the audience may have. Um, so just to give you a, a brief introduction to the, to the project um, and what DISH is doing here, I'd like to state that you know, since the introduction of the iPhone in 2006, their wireless carriers have seen an incredible increase in the amount of data traffic that has gone over their networks. And the world has since gone through a paradigm shift in not only how business is conducted over digital services such as email, web-based databases, and now Zoom meetings, but also in the way the average consumer interacts over social media networks and consumes multimedia, namely streaming of high-definition video content. As more and more users are added to carriers' wireless networks, the more strain is placed on the ability of the network to smoothly stream content to consumers. Um, and to help alleviate this problem, Dish Wireless is starting its own branded wireless telecommunications network. And to this end, we are proposing the site in Thousand Oaks. Now, just to enumerate uh, just a couple more uh, community benefits. Um, for example, emergency E91 services will be supported by the network 
by the network, and it will also enable first responders such as emergency medical technicians, paramedics, firefighters, and police officers with additional wireless field coverage. And last, I'd like to state that uh, Dish Wireless will be fully compliant with all FCC uh, RF emission safety guidelines. And with that, I conclude my presentation, and I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Koichi. Thank you. Commissioner Buss. Yeah, I just had a quick question about the uh, testing involving uh, the generator. Yes. Uh, what is the fuel source for that generator? Um, let's see. I honestly don't recall the type of fuel that is, will be used in it. Will it be here. stored on site or? Uh, chair, may I? Um, normally it's a diesel fuel from what we, um, from the applications that we okay, received. Okay, so through diesel the generators. Yes, is sir. the fuel stored on site there or is yes. it? Yes. There's a tank. There's a tank that's uh, built in into the uh, generator itself, and it's regulated by the fire department. You got? Oh, it's regulated by the fire department. Yes. Okay, because I was just curious how shelf stable that was and all that fun stuff. But yeah, the fire department checks that regularly. Yes, for every um, for every application that we have that comes in for uh, generators, the uh, fire department review, reviews them as well. I mean, but uh, is the fire department actively monitoring those? Not necessarily. So the, the fuel storage there could be? As long as they meet the uh, fire code, uh, the fire department will check them off. OK. And I believe we will be reviewed uh, for the building permit as well by the fire department. Yeah, OK. So All right. <coughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lanson. Just a quick follow-up, Mike, and uh, is this 4G, 5G? What kind of technology is going in here? So DISH calls their technology new radio, NR, and essentially it's an evolution of 4G, and it's just, it's about 5G equivalent for performance. So to answer your question, both. <laughs> so it wouldn't have to be modified to the extent the 5G network became more prevalent in the area that's already adaptive to it then? Yeah, it wouldn't have to be modified. It, it kind of does the same thing. And is, is DISH sharing this uh, facility with any other company, or is this only going to be for DISH? Um, the antennas themselves will be only for DISH. However, as part of the conditions of approval, DISH will be, is open to any co-location opportunities as, with other wireless carriers as long as they don't interfere, interfere with the signal. And typically, there would be an intermod study done to make sure that it wouldn't prior to even proposing anything to the city. And I noticed, again, as I asked Ms. McAtee, the, a number of the applications we have are along the 23 freeway. Is that specifically where there's areas you're trying to engage with or air, dead zones? Why along that corridor? Absol absolutely. If you look at the wide area network page of the radio frequency propagation map, you'll see. Uh, but again, DISH is building a, a network from the ground up. So it's basically we're filling in the whole thing. <laughs> I, I would, are, should we be expecting other applications? Uh, by yes. Dish? In fact, well, there's three others tonight, and we right. have a, a few others in, in progress at various stages in, with the planning department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Link. So just to clarify and reiterate, this is not a sub-6 gigahertz or millimeter wave installation. This is an LTE 800, 1900 megahertz installation? It, it'll be a new radio installation, NR. So, but LTE 4G technology. Correct. Okay. There is a, another operator um, currently operating on an existing pole at this site. So the obvious question is, why not also use that pole? Why, why the need for a new pole at this site? Likely for structural reasons. So it would have to be replaced by a thicker, more visually intrusive pole. This allows both facilities to maintain a slimmer profile. Okay, and then um, this really has nothing to do with the application tonight, but really for my own curiosity, since you referenced the wide area network that, that these cell sites tie into, um, not for cell carriers as far as I know, but, but both cable, major cable providers in town recently have had really significant outages caused by a single fiber cut in, in each case. And my question is, what, what is DISH doing to enhance the redundancy of its own network here so that 
one backhoe doesn't take out thousands of users, which is the situation we've had multiple times here recently. Well, that would be a question for the network operators. <laughs> Honestly, that's kind of beyond my pay grade. Right. And, and I understand this is Sorry. far out of scope from the application <laughs> right. tonight, but, but you know, the one cell site ties into another network, into a larger network, but that one site doesn't work unless there's, unless there's a good solid network behind it. And I'm not, I'm certainly not citing DISH here. It wasn't DISH's problem. It wasn't DISH's network that went out, but I'm, I'm hoping that DISH will, will provide a suitably redundant network because we've had issues with that. Well, we certainly hope to build a very robust network. Very good, thank you. Commissioners, are there any other questions of the applicant? Okay, we go then back to staff. I, I'm sorry, we, we have public comments first. And we have um, one in person and one remote speaker. Um, let's switch things up and do the remote speaker first. And that's Travis Revile. Reveal. Thank you. Um, again, we ask that you state your name and city of residence and whether you have any financial uh, interest in this hearing. Um, Mr. Reveal, good evening. Revile. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, can you confirm you guys can hear and see me? We can. We can hear you. Um, it's probably better that you can't see me. It's it's a madhouse <laughs> here. So I appreciate you having me. My name is Travis Treville. I am a Thousand Oaks resident for 38 years. There's a lot of us here in Thousand Oaks. Um, currently, I have no financial interest in this project at all. Uh, I don't know, I apologize, Commission, what my time allowance is, but I'm gonna do my best to keep this brief. Um, there's some facts that I have that are have been stated that I have concerns with that uh, are not the case, and I kinda wanna go through those items. So first, uh, I'd like to talk about the financial impact. Um, those of us on El Monte Drive, I being one of the impacted properties on El Monte Drive, will see a reduction in value of our homes. Um, I am looking directly out my window currently at the existing cell site. The statement that we have um, tree protection, I do have along my property line tree product protection that I personally planted. However, with the most recent changes to the 23 freeway and our Jans freeway off ramps, Caltrans has removed some eight 60 foot trees that obscured the public and my view from the freeway and the freeway's view from these towers. So I will be staring at the new construction. Um, the next thing that I wanna bring to mind for the council is that um, medically, we are seeing that uh, there have been multiple peer reviewed studies that these radio frequency waves are having negative effects on wildlife and on people, mostly elderly and children. Uh, the FCC radio frequency requirements and minimums, I don't know if anybody has taken the time to read them, but those were developed in 1996. They are well outdated. Putting an additional tower Next to me, I have six children. Uh, four of them are under four, so they would fit into that uh, young category. Uh, I'm not done either, as well as I have an elderly great-grandparent that's living in a ADU that we just finished building on this property. Uh, we are exposed to those radio frequency waves. Along with that, Conejo Oaks prides itself on its wildlife. I have three beautiful hawk families that live in the big sycamores around my house. Uh, I've got squirrels, I've got rabbits, hence Conejo Oaks. I've got wildlife everywhere, raccoons, coyotes. We don't know what these towers will be doing to those animals. And I would ask that a study be done, that we don't approve this, don't give an exemption, that a study be done as to what's happening, uh, that the commission actually takes time to read as to what the effects are on my young children and on my elderly great-grandparents. Uh, and then lastly, if, the, if Dr. Kramer has something to say to me regarding, I know they, they speak about the height of the tower exempting it from radio frequency emissions requirements. However, my house sits about 80 feet above the mounting point for this tower. So 
if the if the ceiling is 54 feet and I'm 80 feet above the mounting feet of the tower and I'm staring directly at the tower, I wanted to know how that would affect the radio frequency requirements from this tower as it's exposed to my location. Um, again, I would request the council take some time uh, and just review this application, review the side effects of this. As Dish has explained, this isn't the only one. This will be the only one that I'll be speaking on tonight because I'm 500 feet from the mounting point. Um, it's important that the commission knows that we would not be the only city that said no to this. Uh, Contra Costa, uh, San Luis Obispo, San Diego, they've said they don't want these towers within 500 feet of schools. We're putting it Conejo Creek Park South, right next to the AYSO soccer. I watch hundreds and hundreds of children running around these towers every single weekend. My children play in that park. Uh, I just feel that it's, uh, we are on a slippery slope. This approval that we get a yes now with a, okay, this is 4G, not sub 600 Hertz. It can easily turn into, we are now adding additional 5G equipment to these locations. So I would request that the council not, not grant an exemption. Um, take some time to review what documents are available in peer reviewed studies and realize that the reason why I and you live in Thousand Oaks uh, is because it's a safe place to raise our children. And some of this technology just hasn't been tested yet. So please consider the fact that there are trees that have been removed. This will be uh, a public eyesore when they add this a tower, a new tower. Thank, um, thank you, Mr. Ravile. Thank you, thank you for your comment. Thank you. thank you. We also have one in-person speaker, I believe. I do not have a speaker card. Is there someone who is speaking in? Very good. Please, please um, come to the lectern. Oh, okay. For a different, is there an, is there a public speaker here for this case? Okay. So is that is that it for the public speakers? Very good. Okay. Then now we will go back to staff for responses and comments. I would like to defer to Dr. Kramer first to address all the, the RF details, and then I can cover the rest of what was brought up by the property owner. Very good. Dr. Kramer, are you with us? I am indeed, and uh, uh, Mr. Ravioli, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, sir. If I'm not, please accept my apologies. Uh, is correct that the FCC rules that are currently in effect were developed in 1996-97 range? Uh, the FCC, however, didn't leave that alone. They actually conducted a multi-year process that completed a couple of years ago to determine whether the rules needed updating. And basically, the physics of radio hasn't changed. Uh, the, the various components that go into how RF affects the human body have not really changed. There have been clarifications over the years, but at the end of the multi-year process, the FCC did not choose to change its rules because there was no evidence in the record to substantiate in a repeatable and scientifically accurate way some of the concerns that the public has. As for his comment about being about 500 feet away, that's one of the things that we look at, even for a project like this. And the controlled zone that zone which exceeds the FCC's limit for exposure by general members of the public, including uh, the, uh, the speaker, goes only about 40 feet from the antennas. So at the point of the signal at his home, it's uh, well below the FCC's uh, minimum regulated uh, levels. And as I said for earlier, just to, to wrap it up, uh, the city has no authority to deny this project based on RF concerns because it does demonstrate plan compliance with the FCC rules. Whatever the city council might want to do in terms of research and so forth really doesn't affect the planning commission this evening. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Ms. McAtee? Yes, and staff would like to add, um, we do not consider property values during our um, analysis of the projects. Um, we do have a condition in the proposed resolution that talks about construction times. I believe the property owner mentioned that. Um, it is uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
um, Monday through Friday, I'm sorry, Monday through Saturday. And also, um, as I stated before, there is 900 feet from any residential property. Um, so we do not anticipate any um, disturbance to residents due to the distance. Um, and I believe the last thing I wanted to add was that the design, uh, CRPD is the property owner and I did work with them and make sure that they had looked at the project. Um, they actually preferred this design over the existing wireless communications facility that's on site with the canister. Um, this is what they preferred. So this is coming from CRPD. Chair, if I may. Please. Um, just to be clear also for this body, uh, there, you are not granting an exemption to anything. You are granting the project, as Dr. Kramer uh, repeatedly stated, this complies with the FCC guidelines and therefore uh, the issue regarding, which is really the main issue that he, that he spoke of, the public speaker spoke of, um, is about RF emissions. And so based upon that, it's not an exemption. It is actually you're approving the project because it meets the guidelines that were confirmed uh, through the analysis that staff did and the consultant did for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heher. Are there any other comments of staff? Are there any questions from commissioners of staff? Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, this is actually to Dr. Kramer. Um, I actually did research this, Mr. Uh, Reveal Ravel. I, I, I actually have an attendant behind my house. Uh, and, and on top of that, it was obviously an issue here of the Planning Commission for many, many years. So I, I've read extensively. But Dr. Kramer, um, Mr. Ravel indicated there was some cities that had objected. I remember following court cases that actually went through, I, I can't remember which, if it was the Federal Court of Appeal that actually ultimately came back and supported exactly what you're saying is that the FCC has that jurisdiction and we don't. Isn't that, do you remember anything about those court cases? There are, uh, Commissioner Lansing, there have been a, a variety of court cases both in this circuit and beyond that have confirmed the FCC's authority. We have represented jurisdictions in some of those cases. So I can tell you the state of the law has not changed uh, this is an area where if compliance is demonstrated, that is the end of the question. Are you familiar with any city that's basically able just to say no, like Mr. Ravel indicated? Some cities have said no. Some cities have been sued over saying no. And in some cases, carriers have decided not to sue, even though that would have been log logically their right to do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I, too, have a couple of follow-up questions for um, Dr. Kramer. Um, we heard that uh, concern that, that this project, while it's essentially 4G plus today, um, could, quote, easily add 5G. Is that, is that the case with this application? And um, if it is, what would there be any review or any change in the project status from the city standpoint? Let's talk for a moment about what 5G is. I don't know. And the reason I say that is because each company has its own definition. While there is a evolving international standard for 5G, in the US, each company sets its own determination as to what 5G is. As for this particular applicant, they have, a, they have their own uh, secret sauce that goes into what they're calling their transmission. But uh, I think, uh, as Mr. Colucci pointed out, this isn't 4G or 5G. This is DISH's own determination. The one thing I'll say about this particular configuration is that DISH is proposing a design that is actually more flexible for upgrade purposes than most of the carriers. Most of the carriers use equipment that is hard-coded to specific types of transmission, whereas the DISH deployment uh, is more adaptable and can actually be effectively, if you would think about it this way, as downloading new software, they can do that. So that said, when would an applicant need to come back to the city? And that would be when they are changing their emissions in a way that would change their current approval. Uh, but realistically, um, they will come back to us when they want to change their equipment to do something even more. Uh, so 
I would expect the site to be equipment stable for a while. Software will be upgraded over a period of years. Okay, very good, thank you. And then my other question is, is um, about the legal status of uh, wireless cases. Um, I believe it was the last time or next to last time you appeared before us. Um, you brought a concern, it wasn't a particular case, but a concern you had that a law uh, was pending in Sacramento that would require ministerial approval of wireless facilities on public rights of way. And this being um, public land, I'm wondering, one, is that if that law has passed, and two, whether it's applicable here. Mr. Chairman, the law you're talking about was from a couple of years ago. It was vetoed by the governor. And even had it not been vetoed by the governor, this is not a right-of-way site. This is public property. So some different rules would have attached. But the law you're concerned about, and that I raised concerns about to the commission a few years ago, I'm pleased to report did not pass. Or more accurately, was vetoed by the governor. Excellent. Thank you for that update. Commissioners, are there any other questions of staff or our consultant? Okay, um, to our applicant again, if you wish, you have up to five minutes to make additional comments, or not. It's I don't have any further comments. Very good, thank you. I don't think I could uh, trump Mr. Mr. Kramer on his, his descriptions. And Very good, thank you. All right, well with that then, I am going to close the public hearing and open the floor for discussion and or a motion. Commissioner Buss. <clears throat> um, so uh, the recommendation is the Planning Commission find project exempt from California CEQA for class one, class three categorical exemption pursuant to sections 15301 and 15303 of the California Environmental Act uh, CEQA and adopt a resolution approving WCF 2022-70729 based on the findings and subject to the conditions included in the Proposed Planning Commission resolution subject to the correction of the APN to 677-0-100-165. Is that good enough for everybody? Yes, is that APN number the yeah. correct one? Yes, 677. Excellent, thank I'd you. I'd like to add an editorial comment though. I am sympathetic to everybody who is concerned about their personal health when it involves technology and profit. Um, I am well aware my grandfather died very young after working in shipyards. Um, I am older than he was now when he died. Um, my father worked in automotive service and died of lung cancer. Um, we uh, have made incredible trade-offs for the technology that we have in our society, and we have determined that a certain amount of human loss of life is acceptable for that. Um, I, in my lifetime, 70% of the wildlife on Earth has become ex uh, non-existent. Um, we are deciding to make these trades over and over again. And so when people call up and they say they are concerned for themselves, for their families, for the wildlife they see in their backyard, um, l you are heard. Um, we are limited in what we can do sitting on this dais. But I encourage everybody who does feel that way to call your congressperson, to call your senator, to call everybody that, that, that can vote on anything and let them know that your voice can be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lanson? Uh, I would share all of those comments from Commissioner Buss. It's frustrating because I know our citizens believe what we're there for them and we want to be. The problem is, is this is something that is a federal issue that we've been told over and again, I think I had my very first hearing six years ago was on this issue and it's extremely frustrating when we can't look out for the benefit of the citizens because we're so told specifically all you can look at is aesthetics. And that's really all we can do in this situation. So I, again, I, I exactly agree with you. Contact your federal representatives. Uh, that's, it's federal law that's what's involved here. This is not a state law. It's not something that, like Dr. Kramer said, it's not a state issue. It's not a county issue. It's not a city issue in terms of the health and safety part of this process. Uh, as to the rest of it, it looks great. It fits the concept, as Dr. Kramer said, and it actually kind of fits the code. So I would go ahead and uh, second the motion or I'll join it. Very good. Commissioner Link. 
Uh, this being my first time at the rodeo with one of these permits is certainly an interesting discussion, and uh, I, I don't necessarily want to get into the some of the more sensitive aspects of it other than to say that uh, in, in effect our hands are tied. So uh, I find that frustrating. Uh, I find it frustrating when Sacramento tells us that we have to approve houses in a certain way and our, our hands are tied in that regard. So uh, we, we have very little leeway and even if we say no, uh, we don't get much to say. So other than I'm not say necessarily say I will support this, but uh, kind of have to. Thank you. I'll, I'll um, echo uh, Commissioner Buss's comment that, one, I appreciate everyone is here, and I appreciate your willingness to engage in, in a civic process of coming together, of talking about, is this a community benefit? Do any perceived drawbacks outweigh that benefit? Um, that's why, that, that's what government at its best should do. And I'm very grateful that Everyone has come for this case and the, the next three cases we're gonna be hearing is engaging in that. However, that said, I am not going to voice an opinion on the rest of what Commissioner Buss said because we can't. This is not a debate tonight between technological advancement and, and health because this is not the forum to have that debate. That is a federal matter and only a federal matter. So it's an interesting and good debate to have, but not here. And I'll, I'll echo um, what Commissioner Lanson said about encouraging everyone to have that debate at the federal level. But the question before us, as Commissioner Lanson correctly stated, is number one, um, is this conformant with FCC regulations? And number two, is it conformant with our laws? And does it meet our aesthetic standards? And because the answer to all those questions is yes, I will support this motion. And with that, I'll ask our secretary to prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Ling? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion carries 4-0. Uh, Commissioner McMahon absent. This is an appealable case, so I will announce that any aggrieved party who wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision may do so by filing an appeal with the Community, with the community Development Department within 10 days. We move on now to... Our next hearing, case 7C, and I'll ask the secretary to please open the public hearing. Hearing having been advertised as required by law, is hereby open to consider agenda item 7C, wireless communications facility WCF 2022-70731 to allow the installation of a wireless communications facility consisting of antennas and radio equipment on an existing transmission tower, associated equipment, and emergency generator within an emergency within an equipment enclosure. Also to find the project exempt from California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA as a class one categorical exemption pursuant to section 15301, existing facilities of the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA guidelines. Located at 1586 Pedersen Road, the applicant is Yukon Group on behalf of Dish Wireless LLC. Thank you, and we again go to Assistant Planner Tabitha McAtee. Good evening. Again. Thank you. Chair Newman, members of the Planning Commission, the next project before you tonight is a request to allow installation of a wireless communications facility consisting of equipment, I'm sorry, consisting of antennas and radio equipment on an existing transmission tower, associated equipment, and emergency generator within an equipment enclosure. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission finds the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, as a Class I exemption, and to adopt a resolution approving WCF 2022-70731. 
In the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code, in the permitted non-residential use matrix, a request for a new wireless communications facility in an institutional zoned area requires planning commission approval of a special use permit. This project is located within an area, area zoned PL or public lands, quasi-public and institutional lands and facilities zone. And this is a vicinity map showing the project site. The project site is located west of the 23 freeway, south of Peterson Road and north of Avenida de los Arbolas. And this is an aerial view. And you can see the center circle is blue and that is actually the project site. The two transmission towers located there. And there are four other transmission towers located on the same SoCal Edison site. And that is located two in the yellow bubble on the top and two in the yellow bubble below the blue circle. Also, I would like to add that the nearest residence is located approximately 110 feet from the base of the subject transmission tower. The project consists of three antennas, radio units, a surge suppressor, and a hybrid cable on an existing Southern California Edison transmission tower, associated equipment, and emergency generator within an equipment enclosure. The subject transmission tower is located on the SCE property, approximately 1,100 feet south of Peterson Road. And in the photo here, you can see the subject transmission tower is actually not the one that you see up close. It is in the background. There are currently two other permitted wireless telecommunications facilities mounted to SCE transmission towers on the same property containing antennas and associated ground floor equipment enclosures, and those are carriers are Sprint and AT&T. These wireless telecommunications facilities are located approximately 25 feet east and 750 feet north of the subject transmission tower. And the applicant has provided the alternative sites analysis that provided two alternate properties. The first alternate site location is east of the proposed site across the CA-23 highway and a Conejo Recreation and Park District neighborhood park. The second alternate site location is southeast of the proposed site, also across the 23 freeway and an existing commercial building located within the Oakbrook Plaza. The two alternate sites were eliminated since the applicant could not achieve desired radio frequency signal coverage at these locations and a new freestanding wireless communications tower would have been more visually intrusive. Additionally, the subject transmission tower can provide higher elevation, which is ideal to assist in filling the service gap to the intended area of coverage. Here is a propagation map, also provided by the applicant, showing the proposed coverage for the new facility. And here is the map that shows the overall propagation for DISH's network, including the project site. City Council has adopted resolution number 97-197, which regulates the approval, location, and design of wireless communications antennas and facilities. This resolution affects all proposed wireless communications facilities within the city's jurisdiction. A wireless communication facility may be approved with a special use permit in the PL zone, provided that the use is compatible with the present use on site and with the adjoining uses. The design and, and the design will not have an unreasonably detrimental visual impact on the neighboring residents.
Section 4B2AI of said standards states the wireless antennas within PL zones must be attached to an existing structure, such as a utility pole. The proposed wireless communications facility is located on an existing SCE transmission tower. Staff finds that the project is compatible with the nearby transmission towers and overhead lines and will not create any significant adverse visual impacts due to high voltage SCE transmission towers and overhead lines already existing on the, on the property and in the area. Additionally, there are currently two other permitted wireless telecommunications facilities mounted to SCE transmission towers on the same property containing antennas and associated ground floor equipment enclosures. And here you'll see the site plan for the project. The subject site is located in the center of the SCE property, and that is highlighted in the little box to the center of your screen. And this shows the enlarged site plan where you can see the associated equipment enclosure. There is an existing enclosure there that supports the other wireless facilities on the site. And there also you can see the uh, transmission tower on the right has uh, one of the carriers already mounted to the pole. And this project is for the transmission tower on the left. The application proposes three four foot high panel antennas, six radio units, one wireless surge suppressor, and one hybrid cable mounted on an existing transmission tower. The subject antennas and radio units will be mounted to an existing 80 foot one inch high SCE pole at a height of 54 feet high and does not exceed the heights of other transmission tower mounted wireless communications facilities on the site. All exposed elements of the wireless communications facility will be painted to match the transmission tower and the equipment cabinet and emergency generator will be installed in a new fenced in enclosure adjacent to an existing ground floor fenced enclosure to the east of the subject transmission tower and will not be visible from public view. And here are the project elevations. This is the west view. The proposed is on the bottom where it says new west elevation. You can see here that the top of the antennas will be no higher than 54 feet high. And this is the south view. And here you can also see the equipment enclosure to the right and the east elevation. So the next few slides show the project's photo simulations provided by the applicant. These photos show how the monopole would look from the adjacent properties and the freeway. This is view one, looking northeast towards the subject site. You'll see the photo in the center is the proposed and the tower on the left is the subject pole. And this is view two. Left photo shows existing and the right photo simulation shows the proposed antennas mounted to the left transmission tower. And view three, looking north towards the subject site. And here are photos showing the view from the freeway.
the proposed emergency generator would provide power to the facility in the event of a power outage. This unit would have monthly tests to ensure power operate, proper operation. To ensure minimal disturbance to nearby residents, staff proposes a condition limiting testing times between 2 and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday in the proposed Planning Commission resolution. And for technical review in our evaluation, the city's wireless communications consultant, Dr. Jonathan Kramer of Telecom Law Firm PC, reviewed the submitted radio frequency report and suggested conditions that will promote planned compliance with the FCC guidelines. These conditions are included in the proposed Planning Commission resolution. And Dr. Kramer is hopefully still with us on Zoom and I would like for him to take this time to give his presentation again for all those joining us. Thank you very much. This is a project that is consistent with all of the other sites up and down this same uh, Edison corridor. The Edison corridor has been used for 20 plus years for these types of sites because it does border onto the 23. As for RS safety, again, we did review the project, determined that the project was categorically excluded under the FCC rules. But to go further, uh, the uh, project all of the emissions that are uh, relevant to FCC compliance are at about 50 feet above ground level and uh, are all in inaccessible uh, open space. So there is no RF compliance concern uh, as to compliance with the FCC rules at this site. That's my abbreviated report. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Thank you. Back to you. And for environmental review, this project was analyzed for conformance with CEQA guidelines and has been determined that the proposed project is categorically exempt from the provisions of CEQA pursuant to Class 1, Section 15301, existing facilities. This request involves an installation of antennas to an existing transmission tower and no expansion of the use. Additionally, the Community Development Department has further determined that none of the six exemptions to the use of a categorical exemption apply to this project. The applicant has demonstrated the need for the site to provide wireless communication services to the intended area of coverage. The project site provides best signal propagation and least intrusive means of installation. Conditions are imposed to promote planned compliance with the FCC guidelines. Approval of the project as conditioned would be in compliance with the requirements of the city standards and guidelines, design guidelines, for the installation of wireless communications facilities and would not have a detrimental impact on the surrounding neighborhood. Staff is therefore recommending that the Planning Commission finds the project exempt from CEQA as a Class 1 categorical exemption and to adopt a resolution approving WCF 2022-70731 based on the findings and subject to the conditions in the proposed Planning Commission resolution. City staff, the applicant's representative, and the city's wireless consultant, Dr. Kramer, are all available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, are there questions of, of staff or our consultant here? Commissioner Lanson. Well, it's not a question. We were just trying to make sure we had the uh, the numbering correct. The, the, your last slide had a different number. It looked like. Pull up your last slide there. Yeah, it says uh, WCF two o two two dash seven o seven two nine, and on. Yes, on, I think it's, you're right. It should say three one. Sorry, okay. too many wireless cases. Just want to make sure we're talking about the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was my only question. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Okay. We, we now go to uh, Commissioner sure. Link. Uh, this is uh, one of those uh, local questions. Is it Peterson or Pedersen? Only the FCC can say. It's uh, Pedersen with a D. 
just for everybody's edification, it is actually pronounced cheese bro, believe it or not. It is cheese bro. That's fascinating, but also out of scope for, yeah, no kidding. Okay, are there other questions of staff before I go to? I hope it's about something in Agora Hills or Calabasas or. No, no, I actually had a question. We approved a, a, a site in North Ranch. Did that get done? Is this for the uh, Rockfield? The, uh, there was one on a water tower. No, he, he, it's about Sunny Hill, and I think Mr. Heher can address that. Yeah, I don't want to get too much into that. Just because I, I, I still don't have reception over there. I was just curious. So it has not been, a, it's not been um, approved yet. There has been some litigation on that matter. Okay. And that is still moving forward. All right. I'm good. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff before we go to our applicant? Okay. Then Mr. Kolichi. The floor is yours again. You have up to 15 minutes. Um, as a matter of process, I know this is repetitive, but Understood. please, uh, there may be folks tuning in specifically for each hearing or reviewing this uh, after the fact on, on video. So if you would please state your name and city Absolutely. of residence again. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Chair Newman and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Adrian Colici. I reside in Temple City and I work for an architecture and engineering firm called Yukon Group, and we represent Dish Wireless. Now first, I'd like to state that we have read and agreed to the conditions of approval, and next, I'd like to thank staff for the great presentation and Mr. Kramer for his presentation. And once again, given that we have four of these sites to get through, I will try to keep my comments to a minimum. Once again, uh, since the introduction of the iPhone in 2006, wireless carriers have seen an incredible increase in the amount of data traffic over their wireless networks. The world has since gone through a paradigm shift in not only how business is conducted over digital services such as email, web-based databases, and Zoom meetings, but also in the way that the average consumer interacts over social media networks and consumes multimedia, namely streaming of high-definition video content. Like, for example, my kids do not watch television. They stream uh, Netflix and other streaming services on their phones, um, tablets, and laptops. That's, they do not watch television, period. <laughs> they also don't know what a rotary dial phone is, and I think that's a bit sad, but hey, I grew up with them, so. <laughs> In any case, um, as more and more users are added to carriers' wireless networks, the more strain is placed on the ability of the network to smoothly stream the content to consumers. To help alleviate the problem, Dish Wireless is starting its own branded wireless telecommunications network. To this end, we are proposing this site in Thousand Oaks. Um, a couple of other community benefits that I'd like to mention are that the site will provide emergency E911 services and enable first responders such as emergency medical technicians, paramedics, firefighters, and police officers with an additional wireless field coverage. Um, last, I'd like to state that this, this wireless will be fully compliant with all FCC RF emissions regulations. And what I have not stated before is that to this end, we have provided an EME report, which is a electromagnetic emissions RF safety report, and to, um, which, will, which certifies that the proposed site will not exceed the RF safety limits imposed by the FCC. And that concludes my presentation. I can answer any questions that you or the public may have. Thank you, Mr. Kalichi. I think Commissioner Buss has a question. So uh, just referencing that EME report, I noticed that this uh, um, set up is going to be underneath a transmission line tower. Um, my understanding is that transmission lines have a certain amount of uh, uh, electromagnetic energy that they release. Is, is that significantly greater than what would be out of your tower, or how do they compare? Just um, well, they, and why is there no interference between the two? Is it just because they're different on different frequencies? Well, for, uh, to answer your question, SCE and the California Public Utilities Commission has their own set of rules regulating the placement of wireless antennas 
and uh, separations between the antennas and power lines or high, high power, uh, power lines. So again, to prevent any sort of interference, both for the safety of workers and I, I think Mr. Kramer would be able to better answer the emissions question from a scientific standpoint. Are there other questions of, of the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Kalichi. We Thank will you. go back to, um, or we go to public comment now. Uh, do we have a public speaker on this case? On this case? No, okay. And no remote public speakers, so we will then go back to staff for any follow-up comments. No further comments, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, before I close the public hearing, are there any additional questions? Very good, then I will go ahead and close the public hearing and open the floor to um, discussion and or a motion. Commissioners? We've got, I think, more cases. Commissioner Link. Yes, uh, I will move to approve the resolution approving wireless communication facility permit number WCF 2022-70731, I believe that's correct, and find that the project is exempt from CEQA as a class one categorical exemption pursuant to section 15301. Thank you. Do we have any discussion? Very good. I will ask the secretary to please prepare us for a vote. Commi Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4-0, council member McMahon absent. Thank you, and this once again is an appealable decision, so I will announce that any aggrieved party who wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision may do so by filing an appeal with the Community Development Department within 10 days. And with that, we will move to case 7D on our agenda, and I'll ask the secretary to please open the public hearing. Hearing having been advertised as required by law, is hereby open to consider agenda item 7D, wireless communications facility WCF 2022-70099 to allow installation of a wireless communications facility consisting of antennas and other radio equipment to be installed on a Southern California Edison SCE transmission tower, uh, equipment cabinets and a generator within a subterranean enclosure also to find the project exempt from California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, as a class one categorical exemption pursuant to section 15301 existing facilities of the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA guidelines. Located at 1614 Corte de Acero, the applicant is Yukon Group on behalf of Dish Wireless, LLC. Thank you, and presenting on behalf of staff this evening is Associate Planner, Will Chua. Mr. Chua, good evening. Good evening, Chair Newman, uh, Planning Commissioners. Uh, same story, different location. Uh, for your con consideration tonight is an application to uh, seeking to allow the installation of a wireless communications facility uh, consisting of antennas and radio equipment on a um, uh, Southern California Edison transmission tower and related equipment and an emergency generator within an existing subterranean equipment enclosure. This, um, this is the uh, vicinity map for the uh, proposed project. The uh, project is located west of um, the uh, 23, California 23 highway and south of uh, Sunset Hills Boulevard. The subject property is outlined in red. It's a, a little bit over two acre lot uh, owned by uh, Southern California Edison. To the north are residentially zoned properties. To the um, south is an open space um, property. And to the, 
to the uh, southwest or to the west would be the uh, Northwood Park, oh, by, operated by the uh, CRPD. This is a picture of the site looking south from an adjacent property. The uh, proposed antennas would be installed on the uh, transmission tower to the, to the left. The uh, Thousand Oaks Municipal Code requires a approval of a special use permit for wireless communications facilities that's located in an institutional zoned area. The uh, subject property is zoned PL, which is institu institutional. The um, special use permit was filed to allow installation of three antennas on an SCE pole with associated radio equipment, surge protectors, and um, cables, and um, in installation of equipment cabinet and emergency generator within a subterranean uh, enclosure. The um, SCE tower is located approximately 90 feet southwest of the adjacent property at 1612 Corte de Acero. As is stated earlier by the applicant, the project is to, um, the purpose is to provide wireless services for this network. There are three other wireless facilities that were, that are operating on the uh, subject property. This is a, um, this is the, um, the uh, enlarged site plan for the uh, subject, for the uh, proposed project. The um, antennas are gonna be located to the south of the uh, equipment cabinet, which is located adjacent to the uh, property. It's about seven, eight foot away from the uh, property line. This is the, um, um, I think Commissioner Lanson asked about the network that this uh, is proposing for the project. Um, this represents the uh, location of the uh, project for this particular location, uh, particular case. And the uh, blue dots represent some of, I mean, the uh, Dish Wireless's uh, proposed network in the city. Some of them have already been approved. Some of them are in the process of the application, like tonight. And some of them have not been filed for application so far. This is the proposed uh, signal coverage for the um, proposed site. It's intended, it, in, it intends to cover the uh, residential areas within the immediate vicinity of the property and cover the uh, freeway, the, uh, I'm sorry, the California 23 highway. The, um, the applicant had considered two different uh, alternate sites as candidates for this project. One of them is the uh, Tower to the West, and the other one is the park on Aviri Avenida Verano. The, um, the, because of the nature of the residential zoned areas on this property, there are very limited uh, amount of um, alternative sites that can be considered due to the lack of uh, tall buildings. So the other two sites were eliminated because of the lack of height for the tower and the lack of structure at the park to hold the antennas. This is a picture of the um, other sites to the west, the other tower that was considered to the west of the site. The proposed, the tower, the proposed antennas would be installed on this tower right here. So as you can see, as far as um, elevation is concerned, the uh, subject tower is superior compared to the other antenna. This is the um, Northwood Park. As you can see, there are no structures on this particular uh, property. The um, city council has uh, approved resolution 97197, which provides standards for wireless communications facility. The, um, the uh, standard states that the um, wireless communication facility may be approved with a special use permit in a PL zone, and the ante antennas may be attached 
to existing structure. It is uh, staff's opinion that the uh, project is compatible with the nearby structure, which are the uh, transmission towers and the existing uh, wireless communications facility. And it is staff's opinion that this will not create significant adverse visual impact. As far as the design, designs are concerned, the antennas are, the antenna dimensions are 72 inches height, uh, 20, 20 inches wide and eight inch thick. Uh, to be installed at a tip height of 59 feet held by three feet wide or three feet long uh, support antennas. All the exposed elements will be uh, painted to match the color of the tower. The equipment cabinets and the emergency generator will be installed within a subterranean enclosure which is not viewable from the public. This is a photo simulation showing the uh, antennas. The, um, this is the existing picture and the uh, proposed elevation would be th this um, picture to the uh, right. The uh, emergency generators will be required for uh, power outages, uh, uh, to supply power during power outages, to be placed under a, the um, subterranean enclosure. And like the other ones that you heard before, it would be tested for 15 minutes duration every month. And the testing would be limited to certain times to reduce disturbance to uh, residences. The access for the um, project is through a private driveway the applicant is responsible to obtain the easement for the uh, concerned property owner, and this is part of a uh, condition in the resolution. And the uh, technical review was done by Dr. Kramer, Kramer Firm, and um, I would like to turn over the presentation to him at this point. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chua. This is very similar to the project you reviewed a few minutes ago. In terms of its RF compliance with the FCC rules, we did independently determine that. And uh, there's really not a whole lot to add other than the fact that in this particular case, this is to respond to a prior question, the applicant's proposing a 15 kilowatt generator. It's a diesel generator that'll be placed in an underground enclosure. I apologize. The uh, project was... Uh uh, team to be categorically, categorically exempt under Class 1, Section 15301, existing facilities because it's a minor alteration to an existing SE, <coughs> SE tower, and it's none of the uh, six uh, exemption, exceptions to the exemptions apply to, uh, the, to defeat the uh, exemption for the above project. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission find the application exempt from CEQA as a Class 1 categorical exemption and adopt a resolution approving WCF 2022-70099 based on the findings and subject to the conditions of approval contained in the uh, suggested resolution. And that concludes staff's presentation and we are available to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Chua. Other questions of staff? Commissioner Buzz. Thank you very much for that presentation. I just had a couple of quick questions. On the opening page of our document, it said that that's 2022-70730, but inside it, it says it's 2022-70099. Which, 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 what is it? This is 70099. The next project would be 70730. Okay, so that one's 730. Okay, I just want to make sure. Because it, uh, it says it up at the top, but it's, it's different there. And then uh, the only other question I had is, uh, we didn't specify on this one when the testing hours are. Is there a reason um, for that? Uh, testing hours would be two, uh, between 2 to 4 in the afternoon, Monday oh, okay, through Friday. Okay, so they got to do that for yes. all of them. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, sir. Commissioner Link? No? Commissioner Lanson? Questions? Uh, Chair Newman, I was just going to say the card that we got that had a question, I thought I would just I would read it to Mr. Chu unless you want to do it. I, I, I'll pick it up. Um, this, a concern was raised in, in a written comment um, about the visibility of uh, equipment 
the, the subterranean slab or surface is already visible to a resident living nearby. And the, the resident is voicing a concern that, that putting an equipment cabinet above that um, would, one, create an eyesore for them, and two, would lessen the value of their home because of this visibility. Um, does, does staff care to comment on that? Uh, sure. The, um, the exist, the, uh, there is an existing uh, equipment enclosure that's subterranean on the, on the uh, next to, um, I believe that's a Verizon enclosure, which is above ground. And as far as um, uh, property values are concerned, um, it's pointed out earlier that the, uh, the uh, city does not, or city staff does not consider property values as for in um, evaluating uh, wireless communications projects. Okay, thank you. I mean, on, on the question of property values, and I, I recognize it, most importantly, this is not a criterion we use tonight in evaluating this, this case or any other case, but just, just on that general question, um, I've heard anecdotal evidence from realtors that when people are shopping for homes, one of the things they often do when they walk into a prospective a home that they may buy is pull out their phones and check for, for signal. And that's anecdotal. Um, I'm wondering if either you or Dr. Kramer has any sort of um, data rather than anecdotes. Well, um, I don't have on the effect of adding wireless to home values. Um, well, I don't have any data as far as home values uh, on a wireless communications facility to bust. But uh, based on my personal experience with my children who are working from home, and they use a lot of cell phones, I mean, they are looking for a strong signal because if they would put value, and this is just for me, and my children said. If I'm buying a house, I gotta have strong signal on it. So, okay. And and again, I I want to emphasize this is really more for my own edification. It, it, I want to emphasize that it's not a criterion we can use in evaluating this case, but it is an interesting question. So thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kramer, allow me because I. This is actually part of my doctoral thesis was on property values and cell sites back in 2016. And I had an ulterior motive for asking that uh, question. There you go. All right. <laughs> so back in 2016, that was just about the point where the crossover occurred where more people had wireless phones than had home wired phones. And even back six plus years ago when I was doing my doctoral research, uh, there was uh, all of the data that I was able to collect in my city of study, which was Calabasas, uh, led to the conclusion that there was no negative impacts, much less the oft heard 20% diminution in, in value from having a cell site. Uh, Mr. Chua's anecdotal data was accurate then and still is now, and uh, people do walk into homes and, and check for signals. Very good, thank you. Thank you for that information. Are there any other questions of staff? Okay, well, once again, we'll go back to our applicant, and once again, I need to remind you that we need to treat each case as a standalone case. So, Mr. Kalichi, I'll ask you to come back up. Um, Here we please go again. <laughs> reintroduce yourself, uh, name, city of residence, and once again, you have up to 15 minutes if you wish. Good evening. Thank you, thank you, Chair Newman and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, once again, my name is Adrian Kulici. I'm with Yukon Group representing Dish Wireless. And uh, for the record, I'd like to state I reside in Temple City. And we have read and agreed to the conditions of approval. And once again, thank you, staff, for the wonderful presentation, and Dr. Kramer as well. And given that we have uh, one more site to get through tonight and it's getting late, I will try to keep this to a minimum. So with that said, since the introduction of the iPhone in 2006, wireless carriers have seen an incredible increase in the amount of data traffic over their networks. 
The world has since gone through a paradigm shift in not only how business is conducted over digital services, such as email, web-based databases, and Zoom meetings, but also in the way that the average consumer interacts over social media networks and consumes multimedia, namely the streaming of high-definition video content. As more and more users are added to carriers' wireless networks, the more strain is placed on the ability of the network to smoothly stream content to, to consumers. To alleviate this problem, Dish Wireless is starting its own branded wireless telecommunications network. And uh, to this end, we are proposing the site in Thousand Oaks. And I'd like to enumerate a couple of additional community benefits that will be a part of this project. And uh, first, emergency E91 services will be a part of um, Dish's service. And the service will also enable first responders such as emergency medical technicians, paramedics, firefighters, and police officers with additional wireless field coverage. And last, I'd like to state that um, Dish Wireless will be fully compliant with all applicable FCC RF emissions regulations. And that concludes my presentation, and I can answer any questions that you or the public may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kalichi. Are there questions of, of the applicant? Commissioner Buzz. So uh, as you heard, there was a public comment about um, above ground versus undergrounding. Of underground. The, of the, yes. Would you be capable of doing it underground or is? Yes. Oh, you it would? It is proposed underground. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes. Are there any other questions of this applicant? Very good, thank you. Thank you very much. We go now to public comment and in addition to the written card, um, we do have one speaker for this case, uh, Ms. Joy Haley. We ask that you come to the lectern, and once you're there, please, for the record, state your name, city of residence, and whether you have any financial interest in this case. Good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Joy Haley. I'm representing my mother, Frances Alexander. Um, I have no uh, financial interest in the property. Um, what I am interested in is uh, letting you all know with looking at the site, you might not be able to appreciate the site unless you're standing on top of that hill. So years ago, we've been um, residents of Canal Valley since 1958. When we were young, my dad used to take us on motorcycle, uh, put our bikes on a trailer, go up to Sunset Hills, ride our bikes. And uh, I remember, like I can't remember what I did yesterday, but I distinctly remember him, us taking our bikes up at Sunset Hills, riding around, uh, giving the bikes a rest, sitting at the very top of this hill with my dad's arms over the crossbars and said, man, if they ever build a house is up here, I'd love to have one. Years later, Contractor came in, built a bunch of homes. My mom and dad were blessed enough to get the house on the very top of that hill. So in the meantime, you know, this place is just not, not completely the, the back of the house or the front of the house, but the entire, all the way around has a beautiful view everywhere you look. Over the years, these, you know, um, wireless communication sites are now um, being built on top of the hill, being overtaken by these cinder block buildings with no roofs on top. We have this beautiful home that sits at the very end of this hill, on the top of this hill, yet when we're up on our deck, we can see down on top, you know, we can see the, the site that has all the equipment and all we see is the inside of that, inside of that equipment. And then the subterranean that they did, it's not all the way under the ground. It's still, it's still up like this, but when we're in our yard, you can still see it. And so, because the, the it's a chain link fence here and you can, you can see it. So basically, Instead of us seeing stars and, and the hillsides and the beautiful flowers, you know, we're seeing 
all this equipment and this cement coming in and destroying the beauty of what we purchased the land for to begin with. So my question is, and, I haven't, and, and I'm listening to what Mr. Chu said, the existing subterranean vault is there now. Our, because on the paperwork that I looked at on the plans, it said the cabinet that DISH proposes to put is on, on, not within. So putting it on top of the slab is going to create it to be elevated, right? Which is going to be at our sites. It's going to be, we're going to be able to see it and it's going to take that part of that view away. But if it's within the cabinet, I mean within the vault, we're cool with it. So we, I, want, I, want a I want it defined to me to what is actually going to happen. And another question I have is the diesel. That's, is it noisy? Does it put off fumes? Because that's our backyard. This is like he said, seven, eight feet away. This is where we spend our time in our backyard. So that, that's, that's what, you know, so I'm asking in the event this is going to be on top of the vault rather than within the vault, uh, it's going to be noisy or cause any, I know we're not supposed to bring up the harm, uh, any that sort of thing. I mean, I've got a pacemaker that I'm 100% relying on. I don't even like going outside anymore because the poles look like they got torpedoes attached to them. It used to be just a regular pole, right? Now it's an eyesore. When we look, when we go out front, even though, like you said, it's a long area, the two miles or whatever that consists of, or I don't think it's that much at the top there. But when we walk out front of our house, you're sitting there talking to your neighbor. That's all you see is this, these big old poles with these torpedo looking things strapped to them. You know, so visually as well as, um, so I do want clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haley. And, and thank you for your patience and sitting through all these other cases. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, we're gonna go back to uh, staff and then we'll come back to you. Okay. But we, thank first, you, Chair Newman. we first go back to staff for follow-up comments. As far as the uh, noise is concerned, the, um, the, 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 the diesel generator would be placed typically against the hillside because it's going to be uh, within an enclosure. So that would serve as a uh, buffer for noise. And the generator itself, which is made by Generac, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. would uh, have an enclosure in itself so that the noise would be further reduced down. So the, uh, there's, there's a natural sound deadening um, uh, enclosure for the, for the uh, generator unit itself, and there's going to be a wall that's going to be placed against the uh, property, which I showed you earlier, that will uh, alleviate the, uh, the noise coming from the, uh, that will absorb the noise coming from the uh, generator. As far as the um, fumes is concerned, unfortunately, we cannot control how the, the uh, wind's going to blow. Um, this is going to be run for 15 minutes um, once a month, and hopefully, you know, during the emergency, um, it will run for the duration of the loss of power, and we've seen the effect of loss of power for communications during our last fire, so um, we don't know how, you know, we, we, we kind of have to give or trade in something for the other for safety of the general public. If I, if I may, Chair, I, I think it is, here. it is important to note that um, we do have a condition with all these projects that the generator has to be tested every month um, and um, staff has placed a condition there that the applicant must meet and that is that they only op uh, test it out if required um, in a certain time, short time frame. And the purpose of that is knowing that they have to continue to test the generators to ensure that if we do have, unfortunately, uh, an emergency situation, that we know that those things are going to be operating. The second point I would make is that the state law has also 
um, been modified to require us to look at emergency generators and ministerially, in a sense, if it's separate, to place put those into place if they meet certain building code requirements. Again, this is a separate case because it's all in one, but if there wasn't a generator at another site, uh, the state law requires us to do that ministerially to add that generator if requested by uh, the owner of that um, wireless facility. So again, it's, it's also a safety concern that we have or that they have um, to meet the requirements for emergencies when they, when they do occur. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just as a quick follow-up to complete the record, the reason why this testing is necessary is actually not as much testing as it is as it is to actually provide for updating and refreshing the lubrication of the engine and also topping off the emergency start battery. So the purpose of it is not simply to test it, but to actually make sure that it is fully ready to kick in on a moment's notice. And, the, and as already been indicated, the only time it uh, operates for any protracted period of time is during a commercial power outage anyway. Very good, thank you, Dr. Kramer. <clears throat> Commissioner Buss. Uh, Mr. Chua, there's already an existing site up there, right? Uh, there's three, three other three. sites. So would it not be accurate that they're already in the process of testing three generators up there once a month? I'm not aware if those other three sites have an emergency generator, but oh, they may not. It may not. Um, I have not seen an application for a generator at that particular location, but it is forthcoming that all these facilities will have a generator at one point in time. Okay, copy that. I just have one question on um, the meaning of the word subterranean. Uh, we, we heard testimony that, that there's equipment, um, the applicant testified that the equipment is subterranean. Um, we also heard testimony that, that there is um, a cabinet that protrudes above surface level. So I guess my question is, is there any um, equipment that goes above surface level here? I will defer that question to our applicant. Okay. We'll come back to the applicant in a moment. Commissioner Lanson, did you? Okay, same question, okay. All right, we will go back to the applicant. Um, you have up to five minutes to make additional comments. Um, and as you know, there's at least one question pending from us. Thank you, I just wanna confirm that yes, all the equipment will be um, in the underground uh, vault and that the, that the slab that is referenced in the project description is underground, and it's within the vault, and the equipment is placed on top of that. So, I, I'm no, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, of, of comments crap. have to be addressed to the commission. Oh, apologies. Just as <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but we've got people watching on TV, and everything has to be recorded. So I'm sorry, Mr. Kluchy, Mr. Kluchy, please proceed. Sure. Um, yes, just want to confirm that the all the cabinets will be in the underground vault, and that the slab, the concrete slab that was referenced in the uh, on the title page in the project description, is w within the vault. I so see. they can't, you know, they can't, uh, and it's just for additional structural uh, bearing. So that's the reason for that, and there will be no equipment above grade. So, so is it an accurate statement then that the Correct. vault? in its entirety is below surface level. Yes. Great, great, Thank, thanks for that. Thank you, and that will be confirmed also during uh, the building permit uh, and uh, process as well. Very with good. With further details. Very good, thank you. Thank Commissioners, you. are there other questions of the applicant or of staff before I close the public hearing? Your staff does not have anything to add. Thank you. All right, well, with that, I will close the public hearing and entertain motion, a motion or comments. Commissioner Lanson. I think it's my turn. Uh, initially, I would say if you could please give your card to them in case they have questions to make sure they can confirm that, I would, I would appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make the motion to find the project exempt from CEQA as a class one categorical exemption uh, pursuant to section 15301 of the CEQA code and guidelines and adopt the resolution, uh, attachment four of our materials, approving WCF 2022-70099, based on 
based on the findings and subject to the conditions contained in that attachment. Thank you. Do we have any discussion, comments? I'll just add quickly a comment to, um, of appreciation for uh, Mr. Kalichi for, for mentioning the public safety aspect of this. Um, we've got very high winds forecast this week, and I, I hope it doesn't turn into a repeat of what we've had before, but we know from previous bad experience that we, we lose cell service when power goes out. And so having emergency backup facilities, having redundancy in our networks is important, not only for everyday cell service, but also for our public safety, because our, our first responders rely on these services as well. So with that, I will ask our secretary to please prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Yes. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Council Member McMahon absent. Thank you. Any aggrieved party who wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision may do so by filing an appeal with the Community Development Department within 10 days. Again, my thanks to everyone who participated in this. We appreciate that. And with that, I will uh, move to our next and final hearing for the evening and ask the Secretary to open the public hearing, please. Hearing having been advertised as required by laws hereby open to consider agenda item 7E Wireless Communications Facility WCF 2022-70730 to allow installation of a wireless communications facility consisting of dish antennas to be installed within a proposed heightened steeple at an existing church, St. Matthew's Church, and other radio equipment, including on-site emergency generator within a proposed equipment shed. Also to find the project exempt from California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, as both a class one and class three categorical exemption, pursuant to section 15301 existing facilities and section 15303 new construction of the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA guidelines. Located at 1360 South Windy Drive, the applicant is Yukon Group on behalf of Dish Wireless LLC. Thank you. And presenting this evening on behalf of staff, is Associate Planner Will Chua on behalf of Senior Planner Nizar Slim. Mr. Chua, good evening. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, members of the Commission, for your consideration tonight is another wireless site. Uh, the project before you is a request to allow an unmanned wireless communications facilities at an, uh, to be installed at an existing church. The uh, project is located at 1360 South Wendy Drive. The, uh, the uh, church facility is located on the uh, northeast uh, corner of Wendy Drive and Potrero Road. It's, uh, it's zoned RPD, resident, I mean, I'm sorry, Hill, HPD, which, is st which stands for Hillside Plan Development. The uh, Thousand Oaks Municipal Code requires Planning Commission approval of a special use permit for wireless communications facility in a residentially zoned area. As a matter of background, the uh, church was built with a um, preschool in 1967. Um, there are three other wireless facilities that were previously approved within in 2000, 2003, and 2012. The, um, the subject application um, is, is proposing to add six antennas within an extended steeple, uh, radio units, search, suppress, uh, search suppressors, and hybrid, hybrid cable GPS antennas, the same steeple, and backup generator and ancillary equipment within an above ground uh, enclosure. This is a uh, site plan for the uh, proposed wireless facilities. The, an existing steeple is located close by, uh, close to uh, Potrero Road. The, um, the uh, subject steeple is located on the middle building towards the center of the uh, property. The, um, 
the uh, equipment enclosure would be placed and the generator would be in place in would be placed in an above ground um, enclosure to the to the east of that building this is a rendering of the proposed uh, of the steeple extension this is the actual photo of what it is right now and this is with the uh, proposed 10 foot extension of that steeple covering the um, housing the antennas and the uh, surge suppressors and radio units this is another um, uh, photo simulation looking south along the edge of the uh, parking lot at the rear and here is the existing steeple that I mentioned earlier that's adjacent to uh, Potrero Road this will not be touched this is just an indication of what's out there right now the uh, closest residential property is located to the north at about 165 feet and the other one at 183 feet uh, adjacent to the uh, uh, east side there are two other sites that's considered for this project which is both at the Banyan Park as I mentioned earlier um, since this is a residential area the um, the uh, structures are limited in this uh in these areas that uh, that has the enough height to support the uh, antennas so this the applicant has studied the location at banyan park um, this location will require freestanding tower at the park and these towers would be more visually intrusive and not enough to support the um, height that's required by the um, by the signal by the uh, by the um, RF requirement the staff agrees that the proposed site is the most suitable site to cover the identified gaps in service as well as avoiding uh, the visual impacts of uh, new towers or monopoles this is the uh, proposed coverage for the project site mainly covering the uh, residential areas within that part of Newberry Park uh, this is another uh, propagation for the site standalone site this by the way includes the uh, other sites for the uh, project for for this wireless Um, the City Council Resolution 97197 was uh, adopted in to provide the standards for wireless communications facility and with that standard the um, the wireless facility may be approved with a special use permit in residentially zoned properties um, it may also the special use permit may be approved if the use is compatible with the present and adjoining uses and the design will not have unreasonably this, um, detrimental visual impact it is staff's opinion that the project is compatible with nearby nearby residential development um, and similar steeple with an integrated wild facility is already operational on that site the existing st uh, steeple structure will be extended by 10 feet which is raising it up to a uh, 37 foot to a uh, total height the associated equipment and generator will be installed in an above ground enclosure which is not viewable from uh, because of the enclosure it will not be visible from public view the uh, this design yields the uh, minimal project visibility and uh, the least intrusive means of installation this uh, project was reviewed for um, for uh, compliance with FCC requirement by uh, Dr. Kramer from uh, telecom firm and I would like to introduce him again for his uh, report thank you very much Mr. Chua we did review the RF safety issues on this project they're a little bit different on this one simply because this site is at a uh, existing wireless site and it's also uh, not that high above ground. 
what differentiates this site is that the power levels coming out of the site are actually substantially lower than the sites you've reviewed uh, prior to this one this evening. Uh, the, the quick summary is this project as designed and is based on the RF maps, I'm sorry, based on the RF reports provided to us, uh, does demonstrate planned compliance with the FCC rules. If there were any substantial changes to this site in the future, I would have to come back for another RF safety review, but this project before you tonight does fully plan to comply with the FCC rules. The uh, project was uh, reviewed for CEQA compliance and it's found to be uh, exempt under class one, section 15301 under existing facilities because the project is uh, entails a minor alteration to an existing church, not an SCE tower, I apologize. And um, no exceptions uh, under exemption for under section 15300.2 uh, applies to this project. The um, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission find the application exempt from CEQA as a categorical one exemption and adopt a resolution approving WCF 2022-70730 based on the findings and subject to the suggested conditions contained in the resolution. Staff is available to answer questions from the commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chua, for your report. Commissioners, are there questions of staff? Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, in the staff report, it also indicated a second basis for a uh, exemption, uh, class three. I just wanna make sure you're also including that or we're not including that. Yes, it, it's included a, um, if it's in the staff report. Okay. Um, and then just a, just a real quick random question is, I, is this facility also something that could be converted into a 5G at some point? Yeah, that would be a question that would be deferred. I, I'm deferring that question to the applicant. Okay, we can talk to the applicant then. All right, that's all I have. Very good. Commissioner Link. Uh, I'm certainly one to be loath to uh, design from the dais, but uh, the rendering is, in, in my humble opinion, particularly unattractive and, and a little bit different than the other steeple that I believe saves or serves the same exact purpose. Is it possible to add an adornment or something else to make it a little less unattractive? Um, y yes, if, uh, if the commission impose a condition to um, uh, provide certain architectural um, features that will make this compatible and staff, may um, if I may suggest, is to have you know, a similar cross that, that was shown on the picture in the earlier slide. Um, maybe I could go back to that slide and show uh, the commission. So um, here's, the, uh, here's the one that's next to the um, Potrero that I showed earlier. With and that's the, uh, currently a cell tower, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. No, that's that's we're not modifying that. So it they are modifying another location that has a similar design but is unadorned and is just flat stucco. I'm sorry. Um, so architecturally, this is um, matching the um, the exist the uh, the proposed tower. And if the commission feels like imposing a condition to exactly match it, then uh, it's up to the uh, commission's, it's probably, it's part of the uh, commission's uh, purview. Chair, if I may make a recommendation. Please. All right. Um, first, I, I do wanna point out that under our 97-197, the design of the facilities um, do permit that in, a, in, in addition to satisfying the development standards and the various requirements, um, if it's a church or other religious building, it can be on there as long as it is an integral architectural feature of that building. And so my only caution about the steeple, and again, we've already had one previously that was approved by this uh, body um, in a different location on the same property, um, is that we have a church who might be um, want to have their own say as to whether or not their steeple is exactly the way it looks like in the photo sim or if there's other architectural features and so I would say that maybe direct staff 
and the applicant to um, speak with the, the church property owner itself to make sure that any additional design features to maybe enhance the steeple is something that they would approve and be okay with just because it is um, a religious facility and we want to make sure that they are okay with how their steeple is going to be presented. The purpose of this, of course, as Dr. Kramer knows, uh, will state for sure, <laughs> is that this is, stealth, this is a stealth kind of uh, position. So that's why I think in our code and our, our resolution, we have this feature, but it really part of it is, is that we're trying to find places where you can put a stealth technology in place. And this is exactly uh, one, of those, one of those examples. Thank Mr. You. Chair, I would also direct your attention to the plans on page A5, panel one, which actually do show a cross illustrated on the, uh, on the proposed uh, extension. So there, there's some anticipation that that would be there. That said, I would also follow up uh, with the city attorney's recommendation that uh, with uh, following up for the final this final design element with the property owner. Uh, it looks like the applicant's proposing it and just to determine from the property owner whether they want that element might be uh, the fastest way, but I, I don't think it needs to come back to the commission for this one element, my personal opinion. And I would concur with that opinion. Mr. Chair, I do see that in the plans and it looks like it has already been contemplated. I, I didn't see it in the rendering, so that's that was my confusion. Very good. Are there other questions of staff? I guess um, my one question, I don't know whether this is for, for you, Mr. Chu, or perhaps for the applicant. Um, why, why are we locating this equipment in a new or extended steeple um, and not just using the existing one, since there are already other wireless facilities in there? Mr. Chair, I'm going to jump in on this one since it's a technical question. And the answer is that there are certain spacing requirements to avoid interference between uh, adjacent antennas. This is a common separation uh, that we see, vertical separation. Um, and as you saw earlier tonight, we had horizontal separations uh, between the SCE tower. So this this is normal technology. Uh, uh, it's, it is a technology-driven consideration. Very good, thank you. And then the only other question I have is whether there is anything that changes with this application because this church has a, I believe it's a preschool facility um, on, on site. Does that, does that change our consideration in any way? Um, not necessarily. All right, thank you. Okay, we go now to our applicant, um, Mr. Kalichi, please. Uh, once again, please approach, uh, state your name and city of residence one more time. Yes. And um, you have up to 15 minutes to give a presentation about this application. Thank you, Chair Nguyen, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, once again, my name is Adrian Kalichi. I work for Yukon Group and represent Dish Wireless. Uh, first, for the record, I'd like to state that I reside in the Temple City and that we have read and agree with the conditions of approval. And uh, second, I'd like to thank staff for the great presentation as well as Mr. Kramer. And uh, once again, I will keep my comments brief. Since the introduction of the iPhone in 2006, wireless carriers have seen an incredible increase in the amount of data traffic over their networks. The world has since gone through a paradigm shift in not only how businesses conducted over digital services such as email, web-based databases, and Zoom meetings, but also in the way that the average consumer interacts over social media networks and consumes multimedia, namely streaming of high-definition video content. As more and more users are added to carriers' wireless networks, the more strain is placed on the ability of the network to smoothly stream content to consumers. To help alleviate this problem, Dish Wireless is starting its own branded wireless telecommunications network. And to this end, we are proposing this site in Thousand Oaks. Once again, to enumerate a couple of additional community benefits, 
Um, emergency E911 services will be supported and the network will enable first responders such as emergency medical technicians, paramedics, firefighters, and police officers with additional wireless field coverage in the event of an emergency. Um, and second, I'd like to state that uh, Dish Wireless will be fully compliant with all FCC RF emissions guidelines. And that concludes my presentation. I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, commissioners. Are there any questions of the applicant? Very good, thank you. Oh, and, and I'd like to confirm Please. that the cross is present on the elevations, and it was actually re, uh, requested by the by the landlord, so it was kind of added a bit later. That's why it's it's not on the, ah, the rendering. I apologize for that. Not at all. Thanks for clarifying that. Appreciate it. And also to echo that the design that design is, is you know it's it's sim very similar to the other to the rest of the church. So it's just kind of an abstract sort of thing, with, and the cross is recessed within the FRP material itself. Very good, uh, thank you. Thank you. Great, so I, do we have any public comments on this case? Um, oh, I apologize. No, just those statement cards that went by. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have two uh, public uh, written comments in, in our public comment section. Um, both, both voice um, similar concerns um, about safety, um, about the possible negative impact on uh, real estate values, and on creating, on aesthetic grounds, on, as, as one commenter put it, um, on creating an eyesore right next to a beautiful state park. Um, so those are the three concerns that the commenters uh, raised. And with that, we now go back to staff for follow-up. Thank you. Um, yes, we do. Um, it's, it is staff's opinion that the uh, project or the uh, staple has, is architecturally um, uh, integrated into the building, and it complies with 97197. And that's the uh, that's why staff is recommending that the applica the application be approved. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Are there any questions of, of staff? Okay, we go back to the applicant. If you wish, you may have up to five minutes to make any additional comments or not. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any final questions before I close the final public hearing? Very well, I will close the public hearing and ask for a motion, Commissioner Buss. All right, I would like to go ahead and uh, uh, recommend that we find this project exempt from California Environmental Quality Act as both a class one and class three categorical exemption pursuant to section 15301 and section 15303 of the California Environmental Quality Act. Guidelines and approve WCF 2022-70730 by adopting the proposed Planning Commission resolution. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add one. Subject to the findings. And oh, conditions. subject to the findings and conditions therein. He'll yell at me if I don't include that. But I did want to add one editorial comment. Um, I know that the um, comment card mentioned that they were concerned about this being so close to open space in a park. But as this gentleman has pointed out, um, E911 calls are available on this. And uh, because of the reach and because of the location, uh, people that could potentially not be able to reach service will be able to reach service in an emergency in a national park or a state park. Thank you. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. I, I, I would also echo um, that's a huge issue right there, especially when we had the Woolsey fire where they came up pretty close there. As to the two people that submitted the, the, the cards, I, I do agree with you. I hear you. Um, again, I back up to a tower that I see every morning. <laughs> Yours is hopefully going to be in a very nice structure that's part of a design that you will never actually see. I see it every morning. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do in terms of that process. Uh, so again, I, I feel for you. Again, health and safety is an issue we, can, we can't kind of get into. Uh, at the end of the day, though, this is going to be as, as um, aesthetically pleasing, I think, as possible in the circumstances. So with that, I will join the motion. Thank you. 
Not seeing, not hearing any other comments, I'll ask the secretary to please prepare us for a, a vote. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Yes. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4-0, Council Member McMahon absent. And any aggrieved party who wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision may do so by filing an appeal with the Community Development Department within 10 days. At this point, I want to thank Mr. Kalichi, our applicant, for bearing with us through four, count them, four hearings. And thanks to uh, residents uh, who took part in this hearing as well. And thank you to staff for all your presentations. We move next to commissioner comments and AB 1234 reports. Commissioners, Commissioner Lanson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I would just say for those still watching, there's gonna be a lot of wind coming in the next few days. So if you see down trees, please call it in. Uh, nothing creates more havoc than trees in the middle of highways creating other problems. So again, if you see trees, please call it in. I think chair has the phone number. Yes, the, the number to call um, is Public Works and that number is 805. 449-2400. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Any other commissioner comments? Mr. Chair, just making sure we didn't have any department reports. We did not. We did not, okay. We'll move next to a staff update. Mr. Dugan, are there any follow-up items, announcements, or upcoming mm -hmm. issues? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the uh, November 15th city council meeting has been canceled. On December 6th, the City Council meeting there will be two consent calendar items, Environmental Consulting Services for Jan's Marketplace, EIR, and the 1300 Lawrence Drive, MND. The December 13th uh, will be the City Council Reorganization meeting. For item 10B, items for the upcoming Planning Commission schedule on December 5th, Planning Commission will have a public hearing regarding the columbarium, and there are no items scheduled yet for December 12th. Very good. Well, that, that will do it for this meeting. Uh, thank you all. We are now adjourned to our next meeting, December 5th, 2022, at 6 p.m. Good night, Thousand Oaks.